Hello, hello, welcome, welcome. Um, happy Easter. Where are we in this world? The um, so today I I wanted to talk about something that's very old, a very old issue that that um that is remarkably confusing, and I think I was confused for a long time with it as well. And I'm talking about the fostering of sweet ramen and. <clears throat> A lot of people are like, well, what, what does this matter? Um, but there is there is a little nuance to it that I don't think a lot of people catch. <clears throat> it's actually, um, and I always admire like how George put in the fostering of Sweet Robin in in the story and how it's the it's Lysa's motive. It's not exactly the motive completely up front, but <clears throat> I want to explain like why it's a bit odd and why people get confused um because george was trying to confuse people and it's um it's uh it's actually it's it's pretty clever how he does the whole thing um and i don't know if it's by accident or what but um here i, I want to show you the uh the first thing so i in fact i i screwed up during my my review of eddard when I was describing all of this, but, um, so, so the fostering of sweet Robin and is, is introduced very, very early in our story. Um, and we find out that Ro uh, Robert goes down to the crypts with, with Ned. And he mentions that he wanted to foster Sweet Robin with Tywin Lannister at Castle Rock. And his reasoning is that John had no brothers and no other sons. Was I supposed to leave him raised by a woman? Um, by the way, this is always, I always thought this was kind of weird because his reasoning, because um, these people all are all raised by servants and maesters anyway. So like, you, you, so it's all kind of like silly, like who's raising him. But you know, later, later, Catelyn runs into Lysa and realizes she's kind of nuts. And so it's really about Lysa being nuts that Robert, that King Robert would want to get Sweet Robin away, not because she's a woman. But it's weirdly when I did my review of, of this and I kind of make this joke about it because it's this random, this random sexism of like being raised by women. Man, I had so many weirdos come out of the woodwork like talking about like the importance of, of, of a man being in people's lives because uh, people raised by single mothers, you know, don't do as well. And it's like, it's not people being raised by single mothers. It's people being raised by single parents. Obviously if you have one less parent, it's, it's going to be detrimental. But if you have two women raising a child or two men raising a child, it's, there's no evidence that that's, that's worse or any, you know, at all. So it's really weird how many came out. Cause I know this is like something that Ben Shapiro like talks about and stuff like that. It's so it's just really weird. Um, that that happened. But anyway, Robert, Robert appears to be one of those people. He should have just said, you know, <laughs> Lysa's nuts and I needed to get her. I wanted to get sweet Robin away. But this is the first time we hear about the fostering of sweet Robin is right here in Eddard one. And certainly when I read the series for the first time, I caught that there was confusion about where Sweet Robin was being fostered with Tywin or with Stannis. Um, and then I kind of thought, well, in the end, it didn't matter because it didn't matter who Sweet Robin was was fostered with. Um, Lysa was going to kill them and was going to kill uh, John Aaron anyway because she's getting the Sweet Robin's being taken away. But that was that's kind of wrong way to look at it because. The way Robert is talking about his fostering, he's talking about the fostering as once John Aaron is dead, Robert now feels that Sweet Robin needs to be fostered because to get her to get him away from Lysa. His reasoning here is because Lysa's a woman, and uh, but Catelyn later is, thinks it's probably just because she's insane. Um, but later on, you know, so this is how it's first introduced, that Sweet Robin's going to be fostered with Tywin. 
and then um and then later on though we're introduced to a a second aspect um and that is well jamie and cersei jamie and cersei bring it up the fostering with tywin but then in ned's chapter we is the first time we hear about robert um john aaron thinking about sending his his boy to Stannis. The Lord was sending his boy to be fostered on Dragonstone. The Lord was taking great interest in breeding and hunting hounds. Ned misses it. Misses it completely. Like it doesn't ring it doesn't like strike him odd that this contradicts the previous information. That there there that being fostered with Stannis is not being fostered with Tywin. Ned doesn't catch it. However, we are introduced it later when we get to um, Lysa, uh, um, uh, Catelyn and Lysa in the Vale. They bring up the fostering there with Tywin, but then Maester Coleman spills this be- these beans. He says, um, "His Lord fa- Father agreed with you. She turned. He she turned to behold." Um, she turned to behold Maester Coleman, a cup of wine in his hand. He was planning to send the boy to Dragonstone for fostering, you know. Oh, but I'm speaking out of turn. The apple of his throat bobbed anxiously beneath the Maester's chain. This is our big clue. That Maester Coleman is nervous about all of this. I fear I've, I've had too much of Lord Hunter's excellent wine. So he's drunk. He's revealing something. The prospect of bloodshed has my nerves all afray. George's invented word afray. Um, and then Catelyn says, Catelyn catches it. You're mistaken, Maester. It was Castile Rock, not Dragonstone. And those arrangements were made after the Hand's death, without my sister's consent. Now, Catelyn figures it out all here. But then Catelyn gets interrupted here and then forgets a very important aspect of it. So... It's on this reveal that you kind of, uh, that everything is revealed, but then George actually hides this. Um, This is pretty obvious that something's weird here because we've got drunk, nervous maester talking. And then she's like, no, no. Um, His head jerked vigorously. And he said, no, begging your forgiveness, my lady. It, It was Lord John who, and then a bell told loudly below them and interrupts them. Okay. For a reader, you should be like, oh, something's up. But what is it? And then she's later with Walder Frey. And she says, and he mentions that John Aaron was, was going to foster the child on Dragonstone with Stannis Baratheon. And she says, wait a minute. I had understood that Lysa's boy was to be fostered with Lord Tywin. And he's like, no. It was with Lord Stannis. Do you think I can't tell Lord Stannis from Lord Tywin? And so there is a... Catelyn figures everything out and is interrupted, but she she introduces two important points. Was it Lord Tywin or Lord Stannis? And was it before John Aaron's death or after? And then later with Walder, she's focused on the first part, Lord Lord Stannis or Lord Tywin. That's actually the less important piece. The more important piece is, did it happen before John Aaron's death or after? Because if the fostering is Lord Tywin, which happens after, there is no motive to murder because John Aaron's already dead. Okay? So the, the, the interesting part and the revealing part is actually the Maester Coleman discussion about how it was before John Aaron's death. The fostering to Stannis happening before Lord John Aaron's death reveals that it's the motive to kill John Aaron. Lord Tywin, now, the thing that doesn't really make sense about the whole thing, I mean, it makes a little, it's not too bad, is that it's a remarkable coincidence. It's a remarkable coincidence that, that John Aaron is looking to foster Sweet Robin gets murdered, 
And then like a week later, <laughs> you know, like Robert wants to, to foster Sweet Robin with Tywin. You have two fosterings happening in a really short period of time that have nothing to do with each other. Because we find out later that that, that under Pycelle in, in The Clash of Kings, that the fostering um, was because John Aaron had figured out the murder and was acting and was trying to team up with Stannis. Uh, and, and so meanwhile, like, so meanwhile, Robert's motivation was Lys is insane and I don't want Robert Aaron to be raised by women. You know, two completely different motivations to, to, to um, foster Sweet Robin happening within a short period of time. And so thus they get confused. And I, certainly I did. Certainly on my read, I was like, huh, this issue, Tywin or Stannis, Tywin or Stannis. And that was the wrong question. The real question was, was it before or after? Because if it's after, there's no motive. But if it's before, there's motive. And that was the thing that that like I'd missed for so long that, oh, and, and George R. R. Martin hides it really well because he brings up the two things. He brings up those two issues, Tywin or Stannis before or after. And then the next time Catelyn's thinking about it, she's thinking about only Tywin or Stannis. And she's, she's dropped the before or after, which is the more important thing, before or after. Anyway, I do think it's like in the end, it came out really well what George R. R. Martin was doing. Um, and granted, there's, there's some discussions recently I, um, I think, uh, for instance, Moon Man put here, there's been discussions recently about like who did George R. R. Martin really plan to be the murderer, um, Lysa or Cersei when, when in, in those early drafts. And I don't know, you know, I don't know. Maybe he was just writing and was going to figure it out later and was going to edit the story later. It's, it, it's hard to say. There, there's a lot of weird contradictory stuff. Um, the fostering of Sweet Robin being introduced so early makes it seem like George had some sort of idea about what, the, you know, what this was, but, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, so I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of on the fence on, on the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> uh, if everyone's being warged, would that be a wagi? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what this uh, what this means. Um, of course, we want to be. Uh, you know, the, there's the super anal people that are like, you know, there's a difference between warging and skin changing. War warging is specifically wolves, while skin changing is like any animal. But even Cersei herself in story makes makes a mistake. She she laughs when they accuse her of killing the king. She's like, "What am I, a warg, a skin changer?" Meaning like. She had skin changed the boar to kill to kill Robert, um, and uh, you know. So she even people in story conflate wargs and skin changer. But I'm not getting this uh, a, a, a the wagi thing. I'll have, someone has will have to explain that to me later. Um, Sweet Robin's fostering makes sense if John Aaron thought Sweet Robin was Littlefinger's kid. His hair color is just just as wrong as Joffrey, and uh, and the book is all for all the noble houses, not just Baratheon Lannister. Um, I mean, I think Sweet Robin's fostering makes sense uh, in story as it is. It's just that he he wants to get his kid to Stannis because um, he thinks that Stannis is the real heir. And that something's going and something's going to go down, and that Dragonstone is a fairly safe location when war happens, because he'd figured out the incest um, because he was doing his super sleuthing. Um, what do you think the explanation for Sea Smoke Adam will be in House of the Dragon, as they want Lanor's death being faked? Will R and D discuss his fate? Um, it's a really good question. I think that they're just going to forget it. They're going to be like, you know what? There's not this permanent bond between animal and and master that, you know, if the master goes far enough away, it's like a Wi-Fi signal and it, and it goes away and someone else can take control. Um, it's not completely without 
precedent if you think that Veramir Sixskins, Veramir Six Sixskins rested um, creatures away from their bonded, uh, you know, uh, overseer. However you want to talk, you know, say it. So it's not without precedent that like somebody else, if if the, if the master goes far enough away, that the psychic bond would end, and then a new psychic bond could link with someone else. I think that I I don't think they're going to explain it. I just they I think they're just gonna let it be and and have Lanor go off and and we're just gonna we just all have to um, accept that you know that Lanor Lanor is off living his best life and and having traumatized his parents and killed a random person for for and uh, and. Um, you know, and abandoned his children and, and, and his dragon and his dragon's just going to be fine. He's going to totally be fine with this random stranger. I, I'd be, I'd be very surprised if they have some sort of other explanation for it. Um, I just think they're going to ignore it. Um, So with the new series going over a game of Thrones, have you forgotten about overanalyzing fire and blood? Are you planning on catching up to at least the end of season one before season two starts? Uh, that was, that was the, that's the goal. That's the goal is to try to catch up um, before season two starts or get as far as I can. Things really slow down um, once you get to the princess and the queen information. So no, I haven't forgotten about it. If anything, it's, it's the, the, um, you know, the new series where I've been going over Game of a Game of Thrones is it mainly has to do with like how busy I have been. Um, that series is much, much, much less time intensive than than putting together and overanalyzing, you know, um, overanalyze, you know, for 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 the. For these chapters, like, you know, I, I essentially with very, very little prep, I can just sit down and like, you know, talk because it's because it's the main series with Fire and Blood. Like, I don't know Fire and Blood very well. So I have to really do research and go over each of those paragraphs and really think about them and and, and, and talk about them. Um, so it's it's mainly that I have been exceptionally, exceptionally busy and exhausted. And so but at the same time, I didn't want to leave. um you know, people without stuff to see on my channel. So I've been doing, doing other things to try to, to try to um, fill the void. Um, plus, you know, you know, I, I kind of wanted to go back and, and do that too, but I'm, I, you know, I do, I do mean to try to uh, get with overanalyzing and, and go on. Um, the, um, hi Preston, will Marjorie's fate be in the fanfic? If she survives her trial, surely she'll aim to marry Aegon the Sixth, King Four. She'll marry Bran yet. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Um, so obviously, Mar Marjorie's fate will, you know, will be in there one way or the other. I, I haven't decided yet. Um, you know, if she's going to die or not, or if she's going to have some other crazy fate, I, it, it's up in the air. I think originally I kind of said, oh, well, the, the, I, you know, a feast for crows ends with this kind of feeling that, that Cersei's in a bad place and Marjorie's in the better place, but it's George R. Martin. So he'd flip the script and have Cersei get off and Marjorie killed, right? Have the, have the guilty person who, who, uh, which also flips the script of the guilty person gets off and the innocent person dies, right? Um, thematically, that all makes sense to me. But at the same time, um, I think Marjorie is passed to Randall Tarley. And I want to say that like, so then I started thinking about like logistically, would it really even make sense for Marjorie to be for um, Randall Tarley to say hand Marjorie over to the faith or, or kill her himself or something like that? I don't know. Um, Cause it's so much power that you're handing Randall Tarley. Would that guy really be stupid enough to, 
to just you know have her killed off or whatever so you know i'm 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 torn with the logistics of like what's what thematically seems right thematically what seems right is for her to be killed by the faith of the seven uh, an innocent person dying um but then Randall Tarley, like logistically, that's not necessarily the most logical thing. Like these self-interested people would would use her as a pawn, right? So I haven't decided yet what's what, what, what's going on with that. Cersei Jamie, you know, with a with a lot of the, the chapters, I've been wanting to like get into the action and get it over with. You know, like have have. Cersei's trial have have Jamie's showdown with with Lady Stoneheart like you know get into it but then um I've been I've been been struck with this idea that like Jamie's trial needs to parallel Cersei's trial that they both need to go on trial at the same time so you need those chapters to be um hap- those those two trials to be happening at the same time but then like Cersei's trial would be happening after the first day of winter, but we haven't heard from Jamie in a long time. And so now I'm like, well, what's Jamie doing all this time? Like we can't have Jamie's trial and Cersei's trial happening at the same time. If like Jamie's been missing for like weeks before the first day of winter, um, What's, and so I've been trying to figure out, like, where would you, you know, where can we have Jamie be wasting time to catch up with Cersei? And even with Cersei, I'm like, do we need more time wasted? Because are they really going to put her on trial the minute Kevin's dead? Like, would would House Lannister stand for that? You know, you'd think they'd 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 want to call like Jenna Lannister and wait for her to get to King's Landing before you had a trial, because um, you just think that that wait. Kevin's dead and you're putting Cersei on trial like in you know in a week like the House Lannister wouldn't stand for that 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 would just be poor form so that means Cersei's trial is going to be be delayed which means if you want it to be happening at the same time as Jamie's trial like Jamie has to be doing something for all this time and um I don't know I mean people have sent me different ideas on what what Jamie could be doing but it seems to be like traveling around and stuff so I'm I'm really I'm really just trying to trying to figure out you know what what to do what to do how to how to waste time with Jamie if only the Riverlands were bigger and travel times were longer but the Riverlands are tiny so I don't know I don't know I'll figure it out um will John Khan kill anyone who sp- suspects his grayscale I see Hal Halden dying violently after confronting John Khan chaos in the capital uh, I mean, John Khan, John Khan is willing to do anything and everything to, to get to his, um, to get his goal. The there's, I've been having this heartbreaking idea in, in my head that I can't shake of Aegon, Aegon getting, catching grayscale from John Khan and John Khan realizing it. And it being like the most heartbreaking thing, him causing like Aegon's death. Like that idea has been like stuck in my head. I'm like, oh my God, it's so horrible. Do I like, do I even want like that brutality? Um, you know, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Heldon's such a great character though. But Heldon's not, well, I guess Heldon will probably catch up with, with them. Um I suppose you could kill Heldon off. Um, you know, I, w- I wonder. A lot of people are, you know, it seems like if it's really going to be a stone beast breathing fire, because, um, you know, is there going to be an, a, an epidemic? You know, do we feel that there needs to be an epidemic of grayscale? Is there even enough time for a grayscale epidemic? Or is the stone beast that Danny sees just John Con causing causing power, like causing trouble? He doesn't actually need an epidemic. He's the stone 
he's the stone beast breathing sh- shadow fire in, in in the clash of kings we have from a smoking tower a great stone beast took wing breathing shadow fire you know th- that's not necessarily an epidemic you know that could he could be the stone beast causing causing you know pain and suffering because he's causing war um but i don't know uh, then again people people are that, that might be too close to the previous one so the big thing about like that um this is the uh the thing she, she sees the vision of glowing like a sunset a red sword was raised in, ha- in the hand of a blue-eyed king who cast no shadow. Obviously, we're, th- we're supposed to think about Stannis. And then we have a cloth dragon swayed on poles amidst the cheering crowd. Well, you know, uh, the mummer's dragon, fine. We're supposed to think about Aegon. But then, from a great smoking tower, a great stone beast took wing, breathing shadow fire. Well, the problem is that's that's... That's the Aegon front again, right? If it's grayscale. But that, that, that's not balanced. That's Stannis, Aegon, and then kind of Aegon again. You'd think that, like, you know, it would be something else. Like, what's the stone beast breathing shadow fire? Um, uh, you know, you'd think that one would be about Euron or something, but there's, you know, but how is Euron a great stone beast breathing fire? So I don't know. These things we try to we try to balance out. But yeah, I mean I like Halden, but yeah, maybe maybe he needs to die. Possibly. I could possibly see John Con killing killing him. Um Happy Easter. So USA is super Christian, but you guys don't get bank holidays or Easter, uh like like uh Canada the EU. Why is that? Um so one of the one of the things I've I've said about America versus Europe is that America is a very um conservative popula- very conservative religious population with very secular laws. And while Europe is kind of the reverse, it's a very secular population with with somewhat religious laws. Um now that said, things to be things seem to be catching up the other way. You know, like you know, I used to use the example that, you know, get, getting an abortion in, in America used to, used to be much easier than getting an abortion in Europe, but now that, that has recently changed. Um, so, I, you know, but there's a lot of other aspects of American culture, like our, our, our separation of church and state and stuff like that, where you just don't have those, those sorts of things. Like we have Christmas and that's it that's what it, that's what it that's the the only kind of religious holiday we have there's no easter we don't get off for easter we don't get off for for uh you know um epiphany or or good friday or any anything else it's it's we've got um 11 federal holidays now in order they are new year's day mlk day president's day Memorial Day. Now we have Juneteenth. Fourth of July, Labor Day, uh, Columbus Day, Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas. Um, though, yeah, that's th- those are our, those are our eleven federal holidays. But um, but yeah, it's weird. Yeah, we never we never we never get off Easter. But yeah, you know. I lived in Germany for a while and they were really weird with holidays because like if a holiday landed on a weekend, you just wouldn't get it that year. <laughs> so I was like, oh, they never do that in America. You'd always celebrate it the previous Friday or the next Monday or whatever. It would always, you're not, you know, you'd never lose a holiday. But, and they had, they had all, of course, you know, they had all their religious, religious ones, even though it's a pretty secular, pretty secular society. But yeah, no, I mean, it's just, um, America's a big land of lawyers, so you can't, you know, the lawyers win in the end, you know. We have separation of church and state. Enough lawyers, uh, enough lawyers fight, you get, you get, you get the outcome. Um, just, you know, the, 
the um, the abortion ruling was is a new thing because we we had three far right justices put on by Trump in, in a very unusual and visual time. Um, have you thought about the statues coming to life? Oh, the ones in the Winterfell crypt. I never thought of the statues coming to life in the Winterfell crypt. Huh. Huh. That's a, that's a, huh. no, I haven't think of, thought about that. I mean, I'm thinking like, you've got your stone men and all of that. Um, you know, we, we, we have all these references in the story of like people turning to stone, like Tyrion being the gargoyle or John Con being the stone, becoming a stone man and things like that. But an actual like statue coming to life. I suppose Crescent talks about the dragons coming to life and things like that from stone, waking dragons from stone, waking things from stone. I guess I never thought about it. I'm trying to even think about the logistics of the magic, the, the, the supernatural elements in story. Do we have anything to, to cause, cause uh, statues to come to life? I don't think so. A lot of telekinesis. Um. Oh, if Tysha is alive, Sansa and Tyrion aren't married, right? Chekhov's gun. That is a way, that's a way to, um, I suppose that's a way to to get around that. If the, that you somehow have Tysha and then she claims she's she was married to, to Tyrion and therefore the marriage that Tyrion had to Sansa is null, is, is null and void. Um... How did they explain that again? They just, uh, I'm trying to think of, um, time to order the Jamie tell Tyrion that she was a whore, arrange the incident. And then, um, And then afterwards, Tywin had the marriage undone, and the Septon said it was as if Tyrion and Tysha had never been wed. But how did they, you know, how do you actually get the stuff undone? Um, my father, it said... After he was done with her, my father had the marriage undone. It was as if we had never been wed, the Septon said. <sighs> so I'm trying to think about so he, he obviously just got some local septons to do this because we don't hear about the high septon. I'm just trying to think like if one brought this before, say, the high sparrow. Yeah, the high sparrow would probably would probably say something like, yeah, maybe the marriage was never done. Um, but I'm trying, you know, would that make Santa a single woman? Uh, I suppose one could make the argument. One could, you know, why not? One could make the argument. I wouldn't, I, I don't know if it's a Chekhov's gun. I mean, Tysha is such a, is such a um, interesting story and, and in, in other respects, you know, you, I guess you don't think about it in, in, in terms of like the Sansa story. Um and does does the public even know about it? I mean, Taisha, Taisha could like tell people, but would anyone believe her? I suppose you'd have to bring forth the Septons too. All the Septons would have to say, no, no, that's true. We did that and it was wrong. Um, all of that's possible. But the thing that makes me think that one couldn't do it is just it would take so much time in the story. Like someone would have to find Taisha get the septons 
reveal Sansa is who she is, have Sansa be innocent, like declared innocent of her crimes, um, like prove that she was not involved in 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 killing Joffrey and all of that. Um and then the high the, you know, somebody like the high sparrow who's like super, super um anal about the laws, like be like, yes, yes, it's perfectly fine for for Sansa to marry. Um there's just so many things that would have to fall in line to get that to happen. I do think it's possible, but it's just it's so far, right? Just I mean, just even thinking with like travel times, like like to get to this point, like one, like Sansa has to become Sansa again. And then San then people have to be like, oh, we want to marry Sansa off. And then somebody has to be like, well, what about her marriage to to, to Tyrion? And we're like, oh, well, that doesn't count. Well, why? And then you'd be like, oh, because we've got this random Westerlin girl and a bunch of Westerlin septons who say that that it didn't. Like, how how are they getting to the Westerlins to get a hold of? Where where Taisha probably is, you know, or and those septons, um, because Sansa's in the Vale and they're they're opposed to each other uh, militarily and don't look like they're going to be allied at any time. So it it's not that I don't think that that logically that couldn't work. It could, but it's just it's so difficult to get it to happen because there's so many little things. That that have to go forward. Um, Stannis was the original choice. Then Cersei said Tywin. Lysa thought they both sucked and asked Peter for help and set the set set the whole murder. Um, this is this is what I'm saying is that like Robert isn't on board with it until. After John Aaron's death, so the Tywin the Tywin fostering has to be after John Aaron is dead, and the Stannis fostering has to be before John Aaron is dead. Like that's the fundamental difference. <clears throat> um. She can ask Peter to set up the whole murder, but I don't know if the, I don't think the Tywin the Tywin factor comes in at all. I don't think the Tywin there was ever a point in which both fosterings were considered simultaneously. You know, there was there was there was the Stannis fostering with John Aaron. That's the motive for murder. Then he's then he's murdered, and then there's the Tywin fostering with Robert, and that. Um, people think that's what caused her to flee King's Landing. Um, that that motive that motivates her to flee, but uh, I don't know. There's any any um. I don't know if we have any proof that that Cersei requested Tywin, or even requested Robert to do anything. Um, like when we, when we actually hear, when we hear of, let's see, it's Bran. So Cersei's phrase is when Jamie says, if she knew anything, she would have gone to Robert before she fled King's Landing. When he had already agreed to foster that weakling son of hers at Castile Rock, I think not. So she, Cersei herself, bring this up. Cersei herself says this is that the fostering is a Robert's idea, is Robert's idea. When he had already agreed to, she knew the boy's life would be host, would be hostage to her silence she may grow bolder now that she that he's uh, safe atop the eerie um so i don't know i don't think 
And I think, I, you know, I think I b- believe differently at different times, but going over things now, I, I really think that there, that there was no Lannister plan to foster Sweet Robin in place from either Cersei or Tywin until Robert suggested it, <laughs> you know, like that they, that they actually had no idea. Robert independently was like, I want to do a, I want to do a fostering, you know, um, Happy Easter. He is risen. <laughs> yeah, Easter's a, a funny holiday. Um, you know, the... Uh, Jesus was dead like uh, a day and a half, but they but everybody talks about it being three days because <laughs> it's on the third day. <laughs> um, Uh, watch uh, Vadi Vidi to get the Elden Ring lore since you're too much of a jock to play video games. His videos also explore the video, the, the game's themes as well. I've actually seen, I've seen, I've seen some of these videos. Um, and they, you know, but the thing is, he has a lot of these lore videos. There's a lot of them. Goes into it and into it and into it. Um, and having watched it, you know, I get I get the impression that he is filling in the blanks between pieces that are given. Maybe, perhaps logically, but like I still feel like he's he's um he's doing some interpretation. So, I you know, maybe maybe I'm uh maybe I'm wrong, but uh but the uh But you know, in, generally speaking, in video games, you get little bits of pieces of lore, and like trying to trying to piece it all together, you have to, you have to like try to create a narrative yourself. Um, how will the world end, Preston? In ice or fire? Well, let's see here. I mean, don't they say the uh, the sun is going to supernova at some point and ab- absorb the Earth, or we'll, we're just going to nuke it? I can't see it ending in ice. Doesn't seem right. Doesn't seem. Seems like it's gonna end in fire, end in passion, rather than desire. Um, Sweet Robin versus Bran. Who wins in a physical fight? Well, obviously, like before the injury, Bran could could easily kick Sweet Robin's butt. But now that Bran is like crippled, um. Yeah, no, Sweet Robin would win. Like, I just like Sweet Robin would just like back off and start throwing stuff at at um at Bran. So like, you know, we're, we're all aware of the of the of the um the bowl incident, right? Where he where he almost clocks Littlefinger in the in the uh, in the face with the bowl. He makes his bowl fly. He goes. Phew! And Littlefinger ducks and like Sweet Robin, Sweet Robin, you know, he's got some strength in him. If he can if he can make that bowl just fly across the room, he can walk back and like throw stuff at Bran. Bran's just lying that lying there on the ground. Now Sweet Robin wins. I mean you know, Bran's paralyzed. There's not much you can do. I mean it's like like let's be realistic here. Sweet Robin may be maybe like sickly and everything. Um, and he might lose a fight to Tommen, but like, he, I mean, Brad's paralyzed. Let's, let's be honest. Like sweet Robin could totally take him. Um, I remember in one of your recent streams, you talked about Moore's Umber's kidnapped daughter. Have you considered that she wasn't kidnapped, but married to a wildling? Moore's Umber even had a snow bear pelt as a dowry. Hmm. Try to think about um I don't uh maybe as part of a dowry. I'm trying to think of um Ah, uh, maybe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Well, let me let me let me think about let me think about this because what we know about the daughter, where where did we hear about his um his daughter getting uh, kidnapped? His wife died in childbirth. His sons were killed at the Trident Robbers Rebellion. His only daughter was abducted in two seventy by wildlings, leaving him with a deep hatred of the free folk. Um. I mean, I don't know, like, let me, th I'm trying to think, like, what, like, is there, that this is from Dance that he says this. Um, like, what is the motivation for him lying and having his daughter married to some wildlings, you know? Um, and his daughter was, and that's back in 270. So, you know, um, like, why has he been keeping this, this secret of, of a, um, why has he been keeping the secret of this abducted daughter for, for 28 years? Um, like what, what was the motivation for going around telling everybody, I hate wildlings. They kidnapped my daughter. In fact, we had a, 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 a properly arranged marriage and it was quite, it was quite wonderful. And uh, it's been, it's been very beneficial with regards to like trading ties and, and like economic trade across the, across the wall. Like what, you know, <clears throat> like what is it? And, and say, and say he, say he is like, say he does have a good reason. Okay. Say he does have a good reason for marrying his daughter to a wildling. You know, really good, really good economics for for cross wall trade. And um, but and he's keeping it a secret though. And there's a really good reason to keep it a secret that he's been keeping this marriage a secret for 28 years. Why would he walk around with that fucking what like pelt like bear pelt like th that's just like pretty brazen. Like you're keeping this big secret for 28 years and you're walking around with your, like the dowry, like around you, like, like, why would you do that? You know, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, imagine like, you know, I have an affair and I'm trying to keep it a secret. And then I, and then I go and I, I, I'm, I, I decide to like wear the gift of like the person I'm having an affair with like on me all day. Like it, it would make no sense. <laughs> like if you're trying to keep it a secret, you're trying to keep it a secret. Um, he's walking around with this pelt on, you know, like I get it. Like people are like, well, wait, are there snow bear? That's snow bear pelt. That seems like that'd be way North of the wall. Okay. Granted. I, I the, like having having a having a um, a polar bear, bear pelt does seem really weird, but wouldn't everybody else ask be asking those questions and be like, "Hey, Moores, I thought you hated wildlings. Why do you have a polar bear pelt? Is it because your daughter is actually married to one? <laughs> like, like this, is, this is what I don't get. Like, if he's tr is he trying to keep a secret or not? You know." Um, so, I mean, what people think is, is he hates, he hates the wildlings and that, uh, and that his daughter was kidnapped and that's been the story for 28 years. And if, if that were a, if that was a cover story, I don't know why he's walking around with a bear pelt, like, like keeping the story, like threatening the secrecy of the story. Um, can we do another A Song of Ice and Fire what if for Sweet Robin? What would Game of Thrones look like if Lysa was caught while trying to flee and Robin was given to Tywin as the story starts? Um, I'm trying to think like, um, Uh, 
I mean, if she's caught, I mean, I guess she would eventually just confess to, I feel like she'd confess to John Aaron's murder. Or is this idea that like, she's caught and then, you know, what? Like, um, I suppose the king orders her son to be sent away, which I suppose he can do. He's the king. I guess, what do they do with Lysa at that point? I mean, I guess they don't know she killed John Aaron. So, I mean, I suppose you can send her back to the Vale or something. But um, at that point, the Lannisters have Sweet Robin. And so Lysa has to send her forces to into the war. But the thing is, the Lannisters win the war anyway. So um, it doesn't change things too much, I suppose, if she's forced to bring her um, her forces in. I, I think the only difference is like where Littlefinger brings Sansa. Like Sansa, he wouldn't bring her to the Vale necessarily. He would bring her, um, you know, or or maybe he'd keep her in the Fingers or something, rather than uh, rather than um, the Eerie or something like that. But I'm trying to think if there's any like remarkably different kind of kind of thing that would happen. Um. You know, I suppose if Lysa got a hold of Tyrion, well, okay, going into this, this what if, if the same events happen, Tywin has Sweet Robin, but then once Lysa gets hold of Tyrion, she would try to do a, a hostage exchange to get uh, Sweet Robin back um, rather than doing a trial and just giving him up. So maybe the story would just end up in the same place where... Rather than just giving up uh, Ty, uh, Tyrion because she had a trial by combat, she would use a she would do a a hostage exchange to get her own son back, Sweet Robin for for uh, for Tyrion. That might you know that might be it, and then the story would just fall back into the same place, essentially. Yeah, I think that's the what if. I don't think much. I think there would just be a hostage exchange because she she stumbles into getting getting a hold of Tyrion. Um. R.I.P. Conman. Did Daniel Conman die? Oh, Daniel Conman died. 90 years old. I didn't realize he was so old. Daniel Daniel Conman is just a, um, he's a, he's a really interesting um, economist, won the Nobel Prize. He did uh, studies about happiness. Israeli American guy. Um, he had really, really interesting stuff. Really great speeches. Really good stuff. Uh, behavioral economics. Um, man, I can't believe he was ninety years old. Didn't seem like it. But yeah, he, he died on the twenty seventh. Um, ah, oh man, that's too bad. Um, um, I'm trying to think of, uh, his prospect, like which one was his prospect theory? Because I talk about Kahneman stuff a lot when I, you know, it's like one of those dinner party conversations, you know, that I think is pretty interesting to bring up. Um, but he essentially talked about Decision making rests on biased judgments. Well, that's true. I mean, so one of the things um, I bring up a lot with him is he'll talk about um, uh, like your memory and happiness. So you know, you're listen. You're li say you listen to a a a ten minute symphony and you're really enjoying the symphony, and then in the last seconds of the recording it there's a huge screech and you'll be like oh it ruined the whole thing and it's like but it didn't really ruin the whole thing you enjoyed almost all of it it was just at the end you, that you felt some pain but the memory 
of the of the whole thing has been destroyed. It's like the bad breakup at the end of a relationship it can can spoil the whole thing because now your memories are all polluted. But the actual pleasure you had was real pleasure. You experienced it. Um, but he talks about these like weird biases and people people make all sorts of like um, you know choices based on what memories they're going to have. And then sometimes they never even think about those memories, you know, and sometimes they, you know, they take, it's like taking a bunch of pictures that you never look at and stuff like that. Um, but he had some fascinating stuff about questions about, uh, you know, pleasure and pain and like, does pain even matter if you can't remember it and stuff like that? Like, um, you know, people wake up in surgery all the time and, but they just don't remember it. And it's like, well, were they in pain? I, we don't know. You know, like what if you were in excru excruciating pain in surgery, but you just have no memory of it? Does that matter? It, it's really interesting questions like that. Like, I don't know. Huh. Like, you know, my baby has no memory of, is going to have no memory of almost everything up until age four, but still when he cries and when he, when he feels pain, I'm like, I try to stop it, you know, <laughs> like, because I, I feel bad that he's experiencing pain, you know, but there's these weird questions about that. Um, you know, granted, granted, I almost feel like Kahneman brings up a lot of interesting questions that have no solutions. Uh, but, um, yeah. But it was, fun, it was fun stuff, fun stuff. I highly recommend just going on YouTube or getting one of his books or going on YouTube and, and, and checking out um, some of his some of his speeches. It was great. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Okay. Um, who should Robert have made hand for the good of the realm? I don't think that... Um, I don't think John Aaron is a bad choice. I think. Hello, hello, hello. How goes it? Hello. Hey, do you are are you a fan of John Aaron? John Aaron, I like yeah. Robert the most. No, I'm just saying. I mean, you know, Robert. Uh, you know, uh, you know, ran the realm and everything. So, like, I oh, think is John... this a super que a super chat question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I don't know if this is after, like, after John Aaron dies, like, who do you choose? Um, I don't necessarily think Ned was a bad choice. Uh, I think Ned, Ned had a had a good moral compass, um, and I think Robert wanted that. Um, but you know, when Littlefinger is doing, when Littlefinger and Varys are causing trouble, Littlefinger and Varys are causing trouble, right? Like. It's it's not about whose hand, because no matter who. The, here's the thing: is like no matter whose hand, um, it doesn't matter because Littlefinger and Varys are still going to be causing trouble, no matter what. You could have like this next one is like if Robert made Tywin hand, does Stannis do anything? Um, maybe not, but at the same time, it doesn't matter. Because Littlefinger and Varys are gonna fucking do something and fuck everything up, you know. Tywin's gonna end up poisoned, you know, or or something's gonna happen. They're gonna do something. It's it's you know it's like people worrying about um, people worrying about like it's like you've got a gremlin in the in the car destroying the engine. Everyone's like, oh well, what if what if the the you know, the the catalytic the catalytic converter hadn't hadn't exploded. Well, it doesn't matter that the gremlin would have grabbed something else. He would have broke something else. It kind of doesn't matter. What matters is that had the biggest what if is like if Robert had executed Varys and Littlefinger, <laughs> would things be bad? <laughs> How you been, Carmine? Uh, I've been okay. I wanted to touch on something real quick, if you don't mind, go into a whole mm. discussion about it, if you don't mind. Sure. So uh, earlier, someone sent a super chat about how 
um, you should watch this person's video because they cover the Elden Ring lore. Um, mm. Personally, I haven't played Elden Ring yet. I'm waiting for the, one of those like rainy days to really start doing that. But then again, yeah. I, I'm, I'm debating if I should do it on the on the computer or the console. It's a whole thing. But um, to that person's uh, uh, super chat, I think you're one of the very, 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 very few people on YouTube who can actually cover Elden Ring lore and successfully compare it to Ice and Fire. The reason I say that is because any asshole can pick up Ice and Fire and then play Elden Ring and compare it, but it takes a very special, specific person, once again, very few people, to actually go through all of George's work and then compare it with Elden Ring. Oh, because... I, I get it. I mean, like, like I know, for example, that there's there's an abandoned festival city, for example, like in Elden Ring. And I'm like, really? A fucking abandoned festival city? <laughs> you know, like, you know, and for, for people, you know, like, obviously, that's dying of the light. Like, uh, you know, like I, like, I saw that, I'm just like, oh, really? An abandoned festival city? Hmm. Well... Let, let me make this very clear because some people are going to like raise their eyebrow at me. But I, 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 I we've had this discussion many years ago. Yeah. And I'm going to bring it up again. Um, I would argue 99% of people on YouTube who cover Game of Thrones, Ice and Fire, whatever have you, are not fans of George R. R. Martin. They're fans of Ice and Fire. Yeah. Sure. In order for you to be an actual fan of an author, you would probably have to like a good and read and contribute and like consume a good majority of their work, which you have. I have no interest in his other stuff. Um, I recently got into Meat House Man. I thought that was pretty, pretty cool. But am I going to go out of my way running to my bookstore or downloading his other stories? No. Will I get through them at some point? Sure. But I'm not in a rush to do that. Am I, I mean, a fan I, I, of I, I, I can send you. I can send you all the stories if you want. I, I have Thank them you. all. But <laughs> on, <laughs> an electronic you. form. I mean, if you want them. You, you, whatever, but you get what I'm saying. Like, you know, people yeah. love to say, I love Stephen King. No, you don't. You like it and The Shining and maybe like Salem's Lot, but that's about it. You're not really a fan of King because I doubt you've consumed most of everything he's done. You see what I'm saying? I feel like yeah, you're one I mean, of very few people that can actually get into this topic specifically. No, I mean, I do get it. I do get it. I mean, I, there, and there's certainly people, there, there's certainly some of my fans who have read all of all of George's other stuff too, but they don't Did have you YouTube channels. Did you do a poll channels. on this? Yeah, what's that? Did you do a poll on this to see if you're a... Uh, no, I did a poll. I did a poll on on wild cards. Oh yeah, you should actually do a. Poll it was a surprise. It was a surprising result. I don't believe the people who said they they keep up. I don't. I don't believe them. I think they're being contrarians. I don't um, believe those assholes. No, no. I so I have a lot of I have a lot of fans who who have read all of George R. R. Martin's stuff. There's plenty of people that have read all of George R. R. Martin's stuff. However, they don't have YouTube channels. And they haven't played Elden Ring. So, like, you need to have all of those things together, right? And I don't have them all together because I haven't watched, I haven't, like, played Elden Ring. Um, but, so I don't think there's a single human being who has all of it. Like, they, they mm -hmm. know, you know, they've read all of George's sure. work and they've played Elden Ring and know it all the way through. And they have a YouTube channel. Those, those are three things together. <laughs> explain to the audience. Explain to the audience right now why you can't play Elden Ring. Well, I get really addicted to video games. I can't. I can't. Um, I can't. It's like crack. I can't do it. Um, I, you know. But um, so some people are like, oh, just watch the the theory videos or something. And, and there there are some theory videos and, and stuff and stuff out there that's very very videos. good. There is. There is. Uh, and the per and the the person that 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 um, suggested the channel before, I've I've watched those videos, and I was I was like beginning a video on it, and then I I just never did it. And a lot of it has to do with just the, like I have so many things on my plate that I value more than the Elden Ring video. I understand that like a million people would watch the Elden Ring video. I do, I do, I get it. But when I'm sitting here being like, well, I really fucking value like the fanfic and my own book and like the like overanalyzing and all, you know, and, and, and doing, doing, you know, Chad, sweet Robin and, 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 um, Brandon and everything. Like I value all those things more. And I understand that they get one tenth the views. I get it, but I still value them more. 
um, in in the creation sense. So I don't know. No, I got you. I got you. By the way, um, you should re should really put up a poll to see like how many people have like read read uh all of most of George's stuff and played Elden Ring or just played Elden Ring and not have read any of George's or George's stuff and not played Elden Ring because your last poll here was a month ago. I remember you were doing this while we were on call with Trey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And you put here, how much of a fan of George R. Martin's wild card are you? Yeah, this is it. Uh, almost so here I put up this I put up this poll. Because I was really curious, because George George had posted another thing on wild cards. And I was like, how much money does this pull in? Does it pull in anything? So it was like, so I so I was like, okay, my fans, if any fans that ex you know exist out there who are who are not just into ice and fire, but are into all of George's work. They would probably be my fans, right? Compared, you know? And so I'm, it, it's, it's like, this is a biased group. These are, these are people that are super into George R. Martin, not just mm -hmm. ice and fire. So I asked my own fans, how much of a fan of wild cards are you? 89% of my, uh, nearly 10,000, 9,000 people, 8,700 people voted. Okay. Mm. 89%. Of my fans, and keep in mind, my fans are have a predisposition to having read other George R. R. Martin stuff, considering that I did Thousand Worlds Book Club, and I'm constantly fucking talking about the other fucking stories. Like I, you know, right. I won't shut the I won't shut the fuck up about it. Right, enough so that you fucking read Meat, Meat House, man. No, no, like. <laughs> Okay, 89% of my fans said they have never read a single word of Wild Cards. Mm. Okay. I, I don't believe that. I think the number is higher and you have well, contrarian. Well, here's the thing is another 6%, I've read maybe a page of Wild Cards, which is not much. You, if you watch my videos, you've read a page of it because I've quoted that much of it. You know, <laughs> like so. That, that I believe. Yeah. So, the, the you know, essentially 95, 95. Now, Here's the, you know, 4% have said, okay, I've picked up like maybe a book, like, or I've read a few stories. Maybe I've read the, 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 the George R. Martin stories, you know? Um, so we get 4% and then we get down to the bottom, the 1%. I am an honest fan who has read many wild cards books. Now this surprised me, but 1%, 1% of 87, 87, um, hundred that's, uh, 87 people. So 87 what people in there? contact what? me. I want to fucking quiz you. I want to quiz you. <laughs> I don't believe you. You but motherfucker. Nonetheless, know. though, trusting that this trusting this is this is like my channel. People predisposed to liking George R. R. Martin outside of Ice and Fire. 87 people liked wild cards. 87 people is not enough to fucking sell books. Like, I don't understand. Like, and even, I'm even extrapolating. I'm like, okay, like, let's say it's a hundred times that. That's still not very many books. That's like, you know, like, that's just not that many to, books. To be like, fair. To, to who, be fair. Who um, are these have, people buying the wildcard books? I don't get it. Like, I'm sure a lot of them aren't fans of your channel. And I'm sure there's enough there to where I guess, like, someone could pay their rent or their debts off i don't know i agree with you like who is who would, are these people i would love i would love to see like the sales figures for wild mm -hmm. cards you know be like what you How? should do is what you should do right now is go on uh go on twitter and and just just tweet out into the void hey does anybody know george r, r. martin that can get me in touch with him anybody i want to ask him about these figures i'm quoting something specifically by the way by the does way did you see george? did you see did you see trey's response the first response here uh i refuse to believe <laughs> i refuse to believe anyone has ever read a full book of wild cards even george r, r. martin <laughs> of course he edits them he has to right <laughs> well, uh, he no longer edits them. Fallout? He no longer edits them. Did you see his whole fallout on Twitter with that guy, Forrest Gavante or Galante, whatever that dude's name is? You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo, he yeah. fucking apologized to Forrest. Trey, don't. No, fuck that guy. That guy wants present. How much was it? I remember you got very outraged at how much money that guy wanted. Well, so I, um, I was talking about, so, um, uh, 
I was talking to my brother-in-law who is a uh, who is an archaeologist. And so this is what, like one of the things that Trey so Trey the explainer Trey the explainer has this big interest in in anthropology and archaeology as coincidentally my my sister is an anthropologist and my brother-in-law is an archaeologist and and you know they're academics. So um just from talking to them I get a lot of discussions about about this kind of stuff. So I asked I asked my brother-in-law about um uh these people that like look for look for funding for the their their little excavations and stuff and he's like and he's like no like um people shopping for super wealthy crazy people with money to donate is like a huge part of the bit of the biz like um you know he he was mentioning that he went to some like weird adventure club in in and, and and the minute he said it, I was like Adventure Club. I thought of that, but thought about that that South Park with 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 you know the cook. But but like he talked about how like people have like these adventure clubs where they like go on expeditions and like come back and do slideshows and stuff. And people show up at these adventure clubs and try to like proposition these old r- wealthy people to give them like a million dollars to like try to do some sort of you know thing so he's like so when i told him about this like charlatan who was trying to get five million dollars to search for some animal in papua new guinea he's like yeah there's just there's a whole bunch of these people out there you know trying to <laughs> try and do that I but you know i can't believe it so, by the way the, the the club is called in south park the super adventure club the yeah super i'm sorry adventure the super club. adventure club yes <laughs> so, but for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, Preston, Trey, and I, by the way, I always hate when we do this because we'll have like these amazing, fucking hilarious discussions and it's never recorded. But when, <laughs> when Trey was telling Preston, when Trey was telling Preston, like, yeah, and he wants five million dollars, Preston was so outraged. Five million dollars? Are you are you fucking kidding? I've never heard you so outraged. Oh $5 yeah, because dollars. because like archaeology stuff and 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 things like that, it's like fifty thousand dollars because it's like you, you it's a bunch of grad students for free and they're living in tents, you know, like. But um, anyway, if, if Robert made Taiwan hand, does Stannis do anything? Uh I'm trying to think specifically, like this. Uh, I mean, probably not, but I like I say, I think Tywin's going to get killed. I think Tywin's going to get killed pretty quick. I mean, you know, if Tywin becomes Han, then Ned hides in the north, but, you know, it's still, it's just, the Varys and Littlefinger are going to do something else. They're just going to do something else. Somebody's getting killed. Somebody's getting killed. Um, didn't realize you were into X-Men. What was your most emotional moment from the comics? Me, Magneto, Mag, uh, Nito taking Wolverine's uh, adamantium or Onslaught saga. <sighs> I'm trying to think like what's really emotional, like really emotional moments. Um, and they're going to be really random. Do you remember Fall? <sighs> I was like, I was like, Carmen, do you remember Fall of the Mutants? No. Yeah, of course. No, no, <laughs> no. I no, know. No. X Men was never my my jam. It was uh, Spider Man. So there was this. Um, uh, so there was this with with regards to like the X Men. There was always like every year some event. The crossover event that you'd have to that you'd have to read, and so there was one that I had when I was young called Fall the Mutants, and Fall the Mutants was um, I really I thought it was a really great, but Fall the Mutants essentially Cipher in the New Mutants who had the mutant ability to um, translate get just shot like with a regular gun and dies like. That's it. Like our guy has a regular, like a regular gun, and shoots Cipher, and he dies. And it's just like so. Like, wait, aren't you guys super here? Wait, what? No, because Cipher doesn't have any like special mutant powers. He's just a guy who translates, and he gets killed. And that was always like it. It always stuck with me. Like, what? Like, you just you just killed off a guy for like real? 
Um, and also, I think Fall of the Mutants was also where the X-Men go to the moon and they fight uh, Adversary. And I think at the end of that, they all have to pretend they're dead. And I remember my favorite character growing up was Nightcrawler. I loved Nightcrawler. And Nightcrawler was put into a coma, which really pissed me off because I'd be reading X-Men comics and I'd be like, when are we when when are Nightcrawler gonna wake from wake up from his coma? And I remember we get to the end of the Fall of Mutants and they all have to pretend they're dead. And Nightcrawler wakes up from his coma. <laughs> and Shadowcat is like, oh, I'm sorry, like, but all the X-Men are dead. And you're like, no! <laughs> no, Nightcrawler won't ever rejoin the X-Men. And so they did Excalibur, What, whatever. But that, that always got me. Those were my big. Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, so prophecies and visions are bullshit, right? And if so, why even need a stone beast breathing fire? Why any vision fulfillment? Or is it just about themes? Um, so I think that that now we're talking about like, yeah, visions are bullshit, but they may be time traveling brands, um, visions from alternate timelines. And so he may be like throwing out the visions to people from alternate timelines and the house of black and white may have just like accidentally tapped into them or maybe time traveling brands sent them. But, um, you know, at some point, these visions, each of these visions should like actually like Danny should remember them and they should affect her choices. You know, if time traveling brand is trying to do is trying to bring Danny to Westeros to affect change. Um, the House of the Undying would be part of that and like giving her those visions. Um, you know, the only I'm trying to remember the. um because Danny definitely remembers the visions of the mother of mother when she's when she's heading to Yunkai and stuff like that. So the House of the Undying does <coughs> <coughs> have her change her mind, a, you know, a couple times. Though I would I wish it would have been a little more explicit, like why she chooses to go into Slaver's Bay. Because that's such a huge decision to go into Slaver's Bay and then to kill the slavers there. You know, had it been linked, I wish it was like linked to her visions at the House of the Undying a little more because then we could kind of like connect it to the causation of, of Time Traveling Bran. But um, I don't know. Carmine, do you, do you think about any of these things? What, how do you? I've never asked you how you feel about time traveling, Bran. Or are you just like, eh, what, whatever? What's the, what's the super chat? Sorry, sorry, I was. Uh... This is this is like all prop. Like, so I would say before I came onto the scene, most most of the fandom thought that prophecies just existed for the sake of existing, and were just like foreshadowing themes that. George was popping in and then all these prophecies were just going to happen. Um, and then I kind of like introduced this idea that no, maybe they're all bullshit and they're from troublemakers who are like trying to cause problems. Probably the, ch I think my original idea was the children of the forest wanted to cause humanity to go to war with itself. Um, and this was all based on George R. Martin's previous writings with regards to the, the Harangan mines, but time traveling brand has made it, my mind, you know, I've changed my mind a bit because of time traveling brand. Like once the show kind of revealed that time traveling brand is a real thing, 
And then you um, started getting into George's other works, and you started you started seeing there's a lot of time traveling there. Yeah, yeah I, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to tell you that I was a basic bitch who also believed like the whole visions and prophecy, and it was not yeah. the work of time traveling Brand. I still don't know. Maybe he'll include that from his other works. It's a strong possibility because that's been consistent through his other stories, right? Like, do you think time traveling Brand is the ultimate cause of most of the visions? Uh, no, not most of the visions. I, I, we had this discussion with Trey. Um, I recently put it in the, the Night King video I uploaded. I, I like that time traveling Bram was probably behind the wall or maybe behind the Night, uh, not the Night King, the Mad King wanting to burn everything mm. to try to like, fix certain things. I like that theory. And you can also attribute that to the book as well. But behind most visions and, and, and prophecies and stuff like that, I don't think so. Well, who do you think is behind the House of the House of the Undying? Uh, I don't know. I haven't really like, thought like for that a lot of stuff in Westeros, you could be like, well, that was, that was blood Raven. Oh, that was Quaith. That was Marwin. You know, like people with whoever has a glass candle can, can be caught, can be causing stuff too. But then, then there's just other stuff, you know, like, do, who... do you ultimately always come back to it? It's blood Raven versus the great other. Is that what you're doing or it's... no? I mean, I used to always go back to, it was always blood Raven and blood Raven is being controlled by the children of children of the forest. And so they're just cause mm -hmm. they're just trying to cause chaos. They're just little fingering the world. But now with time traveling brand, I'm like, uh, yeah, he's causing a lot of trouble, but he's trying to cause the events to happen a certain way, you know? Um, and so he needs to like, you know, he's consciously saying, okay, this person needs to receive this vision in order for them to do something else at a certain point, you know? Right. Yeah. So I, for I forgot if it was you or someone else who had the idea that it was blood Raven and the great other against the Lord of light followers, because Lord of light followers are, or, or, or the Lord of light himself is always trying to. Uh, send people vision in the flames, which is why everyone keeps staring at the flames. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I character. never believed in gods. Like, I've never believed in gods. But I, you know, maybe at one time I thought maybe there was a team of uh, Relore followers with glass candles who were causing trouble as well mm. in like a big battle of some sort. A, 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 like, a, there was an ice front and a fire front, um, you know, or something like that. Um, like a Blood Raven bitter steel divide but now i'm not so sure now now i'm just like everything goes back to blood time traveling brand i think that, i think i would know. need more evidence for for to like fully get on board time traveling brand because oh, wow. behind, him behind him being behind most things mm. uh -huh. i'm just saying you know time travels in the story when how to you know why not have it be time traveling brand um let's see um uh did you um did carmine explain x-men 97 is the new tv series um carmine have you been watching x-men did you watch the the the, the old x-men cartoon no, I was a Spider-Man fan. I have been watching mm. the new one. I tried. I think I, I said this to you last week, and I don't. I think you mis misunderstood me. Uh, I wasn't talking about the original X-Men cartoon. I was talking about the very the brand new one. They're continuing it. It's on Disney Plus. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, no, no. I understand. Like, I didn't watch too much of like X like X-Men '97 back in '97 or the new X-Men '97. Um, you know, I understand that it's in the style of the the rebooted x-men comic that i that i did read um, mm -hmm. but i didn't watch too many of i mean i it, i know like it has an incredible theme music and all of that and i think i, I think i watched a few episodes but nothing nothing huge keep in mind i was in you should definitely I, i'm continuing with it I, i'm enjoying a lot of it so far even though i didn't watch the original it catches you up on a lot of stuff so yeah it is um Let me see. Hold on a second. Da, 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 da. Um. 
Oh, the statues in the crypts is the dead men of Dunharrow, but not useless. They have physical substance to hit things instead of just going boo. Um, <laughs> this is this idea that um, what well, the the Dunharrow are, are are those the are those the ghosts from from Lord of the Rings that come in at the end, um, or or am I thinking of something else? I know I know it's from from. From um, no, I'm I'm confusing. I'm confusing. I know it's from from uh, um, wrote out. No, you're right. It, it's 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 those it guys. Mm-hmm. It is yeah. those guys. Okay. Under the mountains. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But the the but the statues would come alive and start fighting and and have have like the souls of the Starks in them or something. But you'd only get one, you'd only get one king, and um, I mean I, I imagine you get a few dozen of them because the, the lower levels seem to be kind of collapsed and you can't get down to those kings or whatever. But you only get a few few dozen of these stone these stone warriors. I don't know how use, useful they'd be, stone warriors in the middle of the ice. Um, considering we have we have like an army of the dead of that's gonna be tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. Um, but it's kind of funny to think like you're gonna have this like Ned statue and this Brandon statue and this Liana statue like fighting, like doing moves. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, what's your favorite uh, from a thousand world stories I'm drunk been talking to my dad and listening to music for the last six hours the um, my favorites are the glass flower uh, I think that's a really great one I really like um, I mean I think so, uh, I think a song for Leo is really good I think Sand Kings is really good um I'm trying to um I have to bring up my my um my list of them. Hold on. Thou- isn't there a thousand worlds? There there here we go. Um going through them all. Let's see here. <clears throat> There's now a wiki on the Thousand Worlds, by the way. Let's see here. Let's see. The he- Hero's Fine. Morning Comes Mistfall. This is a pretty good one. You should definitely definitely read with Morning Comes Mistfall. Override is pretty crap. Song for Leo is really, really good. And Seven Times Never Kill Man. You should definitely read. Or you should definitely read that one. This is Really crazy one. You should definitely, and it's it relates to Ice and Fire quite a bit. The Runners is whatever. Men at Greywater Station. I I quite like that one actually. Um, this Tower of Ashes. Ah, oh, I love this Tower of Ashes. This is a really fucking good one. This is a really good one. You should read this Tower of Ashes. It kind of kind of messes up with your mind. Messes with your mind. Beast for Norn is whatever. Meat House Man is incredible. You should definitely read Meat House Man. Is Meat House Man my favorite? Oh, it might be. I don't know. Star Ladies, whatever. Nobody Leaves New T- Pittsburgh is crap. In the House of the Worm is is really good read. Um, interesting. Very interesting. I don't know. if it's, I wouldn't put it at the best, but you, you, I think you should read it nonetheless. Stone City is pretty good. Dying of the Light. It's a pretty good novel. I think you should read Dying of the Light. Bitter Blooms, pretty good. Call Moses is whatever. Worship is whatever. Way of Cross and Dragon, eh, that's all right. Sand Kings is really good. Night Flyers is whatever. Guardians, um, whatever. Plague Star, whatever. Loaves and Fishes, whatever. Second Helping is whatever. Man from Heaven, whatever. Glass Flower. Glass Flower is, Glass Flower is my favorite. I think it's my favorite. Um, but uh, that's that's my that's my list. That's the list, but. Um, uh, 
it's not Easter for every Christianity, right? No, it's, it all depends on the uh, the calendar. If you use Julian versus Gregorian calendar, um, so the Eastern Orthodox and the the Oriental Orthodox as well don't necessarily have it. Uh, thank you, Hamza. Hamza, my my favorite, my favorite of Muhammad's companions. <laughs> um. Woke bridge couldn't handle alpha ship energy. Are sheer forces mandated by Boon's liberal agenda? Why are people so fucking stupid? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what this means, Jimmy. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm I'm all for liberal agendas. I mean, what else we got? What's what else we got? I mean, I certainly don't like conservative agendas. What 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 are we getting out of conservative agendas? I mean, how does that make anyone's life better? That's that's. I'm gonna what ask I, you about that. Your opinion on the the bridge collapse? Because uh, I know you're. A, oh, oh, is that what it's on? The bridge collapse. Yeah. Oh, woke bridge couldn't handle the alpha ship's energy. Gotcha. Oh, I see. That's the joke. I'm sorry that I missed that. <laughs> you didn't guess that. Like, oh. I was being a little dense. I was being a little dense. Um. It's it's. I feel bad for the city of Baltimore. You, can, you know, they're 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 that's that, that port is really important for them. Um, but um, well, I don't know what to feel about the bridge collapse. It's just it's a sad sad thing. I I think they said there was some like power outage or something that caused the caused the um the ship to crash into the the bridge. Right. You know it's, what's even more sad than that. Hmm. All the conspiracy theories popping up. I miss the old days when accidents were just accidents instead of like a liberal right. agenda. Like I think I said somebody with like CIA cranes and stuff like that, and you're like, oh god. No. <laughs> like, come on. The good old days. <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean it's um it's poor poor bridge. Poor 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 I mean, also like seven seven six or seven people died. And all the jobs, all the all the money lost, all the shipping problems. It's um, not to mention Baltimore traffic. Ugh, but um, any evidence that Picel advised Robert about fostering Sweet Robin? He knew the details of the situation and liked Tywin. Um. You know, there's Picel doesn't say anything and about it. I mean, Picel mentions that he needed to lead, uh, have John Aaron die um, because of the fostering with Stannis. But we don't have any evidence that Picel was talking to Robert about it. When Robert talks to Ned, he fully thinks it's his idea, like that that uh, this needs to happen. So. Um, you know, it just ne- it just never comes up in that in that in that respect. So we don't really have anything. Um, I mean, it's, you know, not that it couldn't have that it might have happened, but we don't have anyone mentioning that Picel talked to Robert about it, and that that it was really his idea. I mean, you know, a, a really sneaky maester is the type of person that would make one think that it was their idea, and so you know, it, it, it's certainly something you could you could add in later. But the thing is, Picel's dead, so it's hard to even have Picel like talk about it later. But like I say, I mean, it would help explain the the remarkable coincidence that we have two fosterings um, happening so close to each other. Uh, uh, um, come from a family of lawyers, five generations, and the consensus is that. Um, SC plays more important role than the president, except in times of war. Very unbalanced now and worrisome. Oh, the Supreme Court. Um, I agree with this. I would I would say that, like, in many respects, the president, who is the president, doesn't matter except on who gets to appoint Supreme Court justices. Like, yeah, which, which I mean, it's a little overstatement. There, there's a few other things that, I mean, the main thing that the president does, they, they, they set the agenda for the budgets and things like that. 
But if you have a unified Congress, then they could, you know, push things forward and do things that respect um, without the president. But um, we tend not to have very unified Congresses. So like um, now, but of course, you know, now that I'm like, but now that I'm actually a Fed, I, you know, I kind of thought that before when I was looking at like the, like the roles, but now that I'm a Fed, like when you're talking about like who is, who is appointing all of the um, uh, uh, presidential appointees to head each of the agencies, DOD, state, you end up having some huge changes, huge changes on, you know, that can happen on foreign policy and whatever. It used to be that there wasn't much difference between presidents on foreign policy. And then all of a sudden there's been a big shift. Um, so, I mean, I do agree that like the Supreme Court is like, the thing is the president appoints the Supreme Court. So, you know, it's, it's kind of important. Um, but like who's who like on day to day life, there's a good, there's a good, um, there's a good argument to be made that the Supreme Court has has a lot of power, but the president appoints who's on the uh, who's who's on the Supreme Court, and the president appoints, you know, who's in charge of the Department of Transportation and who's in charge of the Department of Homeland Security and who's in charge of the Department of Defense and who's in charge of the Department of State, you know. So there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of you know. Trump did a lot of crap. You can see how things like went to hell when you've got somebody like that doesn't know what they're doing or causing causing ruckus. So uh, maybe twenty years ago this would have been more accurate. I don't know. I um. Mm, mm. All right, where are we? Yeah, Elden Ring involves an afterlife involving tree-based consciousness. I, I I joke. I sent out a tweet a long time ago that was like, "Imagine you hired George Lucas to write uh, to write your your the backstory for your world," and he's like, "Okay, I've got this idea for this battle station that destroys planets," and you'd be like, "Really, George Lucas?" Really? And he's like, yeah, completely original. Here, now please give me $2 million. I'm supposed to give you $2 million for, for coming up with a world where there's a battle station that can, that, can, that can destroy planets. Really? That's like Elden Ring, you know. It's this world where there's this tree, and when you die, your souls go into the tree. I mentioned that, and my wife's like, but that's, that's also Ender's Game. I was like, is it? I haven't read Ender's Game. Did you read Ender's Game, Carmine? No, uh, oh. that's Ender's Game. Really? I thought it was about like this kid going into space, and they use his genius intellect to genocide aliens. I, 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 you know, I, I don't know the specifics, but she says there's, she says that there's some trees in in Elden Ring, or not in Elden Ring, in Ender's Game. <clears throat> um, how's Tyrion three coming along? Any updates on the next chapter call? Also, ever been to New Zealand? Um. So yes, um, Tyrion three is it's 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 nearly done. Um, still have some more time with the the editors, but um, I think it I think the like plot wise it came together quite nicely. I just you know I'd like the language to sound a little more like Tyrion, so we're we're, we're playing around with it a little more with that. But for the most part, you know. All the events that needed to happen happen um, nicely. It's uh, paced well and things like that. So, you know, it'll it, it'll it'll still be some time before it's out, but um, it's being worked on, and it's you know, I, I look at it every day. Um, and the next chapter call, you know, I think we got to try to bite the bullet and put out a Jamie one, but like I'm still, you know, I talked about earlier. I'm still trying to figure out Jamie's timeline. Um, and, you know, I have to see like when he was abducted, when people start talking about it, you know, him missing and what he was doing for all of that time. Um, you know, it's like, I'd like it. I, you know, I, I want to get him into that cave 
uh, in front of Lady Stoneheart as quickly as possible. But it's like, how do I explain the the uh, the weeks that he's been missing and things like that? So I don't know. That'll come up with something. Um, and have I ever been to New Zealand? I have. I've been to New Zealand. I um, went to Hobbiton. I climbed Mount Doom. I um, I totaled a car. I nearly died. Um, it was cra- some crazy times. Crazy times. Do I have my New Zealand? I'm just looking here if I have my New Zealand uh, photos on here. Do 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 on my computer here. Yeah, I nearly I nearly died in in uh, New Zealand. I um, yeah, yeah. I decided to go to um. What did I do here? Do do do. Let's see here. Let's see if I got. Oh yeah. Ah, some quick, some quick. Um. Look at some photos here. Hold on a second. Sentinels now finder. Is this gonna bring up my whole? There we go. So let's see here. New Zealand. I went to Hobbiton. Hobbiton movie set tourist farms. A lot of sheep. There's the the toilet. <laughs> People go and see the hobbit holes. I think I've got a picture of me. Here's me in front of these hobbit holes. Here's me like peeking out of a hobbit hole. Um, me in the hobbit holes. Man, I took a lot of the hobbit pictures. Trying to put on stuff. That's about it. I, you know, I, I had some hair back then. Um, geysers, Rotorua, it's a, it's a, and then I think I, oh, that's why I went to Vanuatu, but yeah, eventually, um, Vanuatu was incredible, beautiful, beautiful place. I used to have so much fun in my life. <laughs> What do you mean? You still do? What do you mean? Um, you know the Carmine has never left America. Well, <laughs> I mean that's kind of that's kind of tr- that's kind right since of you, tr- since you were like a young kid, but like you know that's just amazing though. I would just feel like I would just feel like I'm in jail. Um, Stone. Yeah, I know. Don't some visions kind of uh, kind of directly come true? Mel saw Renly's armor smashing Stannis at the walls of King's Landing. Also, Maggie got Bobby's number of kids right. Um, no, Maggie didn't get Bobby's number of kids right. Like, how, we have no we have no idea how many children Robert Baratheon has. I, I always think it's very funny when people are like, "Oh, well, you know." Maggie the Frog got Robert's children right. What? I, what? What are you talking about? Like, she said a number. We have no verification of that number. None. Zero. Um, but yes, some visions do come true. Obviously, visions come true. We saw visions of of the Red Wedding. They came true. We saw uh, a corpse at the prow of a ship. Um it becoming Victorian. Uh, we saw Danny, all these people screaming mother. That happened several times to Danny. Visions come true all the time. Visions also don't come true. You know, we saw Rago, um, you know, things like that. Um, you know, the, the ghost of high heart stuff, you know, most of that came true. Flopping fish and stuff like that. Um, and so it's not that, it, the thing is, is that, Prophecies can come true for a lot of reasons. Like people can want, like can get a can get an idea and then want to make that happen. You know, um, and so the you know prophecy can help can help make it fulfilling. It can be self fulfilling. You know, um, there was a uh, that's what flash forward is about, right? Like everybody gets a vision of the future and then 
half of the world wants their visions to happen and half to, half like are fighting to have, have them not happen and things like that. Um, but yeah, Maggie did not get Maggie did not get Robert Baratheon's children. No. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, but the thing is, is like visions happening. Like one, people can guess the future as well. Like you can just, or if you see something's going to happen, you know, and, you know, so, you know, you can guess the future. You may have information other people don't know. You can, you can, uh, people can want the vision to come true and therefore like fulfill it. Or maybe it's time travel from a previous timeline where it did happen, you know, or whatever. There's a lot of reasons why prophecy could come true. Could come true. Um, first time asker. In Feast, Bronn has taken in four household knights. What are the odds that Sir Shadrick is actually one of those knights and is seeking to bring Sansa to Bronn? Uh, I would put that as pretty low, only because Shadrick is, I mean, when they say that he has taken in household knights, what they mean is that, like, they're physically there. Um, let's bring up this, um, I mean, Shadrick is physically in the veil, and we know he's physically in the veil. Like, you know, Brienne runs into him on the road. And then he's in the veil at the end of a feast for crows and at the beginning of the winds of winter, right before the first day of winter. Um, so there's timeline wise, there's just no way he's getting from the veil back down to Stokeworth uh, to, to be to be there for when for when Cersei mentions that he's taken in household nights. Um, trying to see here. here. Jamie, I'm trying to think. Um, let's try to. Braun, 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 Braun. Braun was the imp's creature. He's gathering cell swords. Let's see. Gathering swords for the dwarf. Braun has only a few men about him now. Um, I mean, I trust, you know, I believe that it's when you say that that's four, but, um, when I ordered Bronze seized, one of his knights had the insolence to say that I should do as Lord, Lord Stokeworth said. He called him Lord Stokeworth. I, you know, the only thing I'm wondering is like, who the, you know, are there other characters that he could, that could be these um, household knights? And I don't know. I mean, they have to be pretty suicidal and small time to be following Brawn. So, and I'm trying to, you know, I don't know many knights who have appeared in the story that would, that would fit that, would fit the bill to be in Brawn's company. I mean, there might be, but I can't think of any. Like, um, like we hear about the, the knights we hear about are like the knights that are at court and they all are involved in like Cersei's situation, um, like Sir Tal of the Tall and stuff like that. And they're all they all get kind of arrested. And then we hear about a lot of knights going with Jamie and stuff like that. So to be to be a household knight who would fall in with brawn is um the only ones who 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 would kind of fit the bill i could see sir illifer the penniless or something like that he could probably make it in right cuz they start talking about maybe he could take in like sir illifer the penniless or somebody like that, and he would be one of Braun's, because they were looking for work. Not that it's like relevant at all. Like they, they you know, who who's working for Braun could be anybody. But um, but uh, but you know, if you're if you're looking to reuse characters, 
you know, then it would be, you could have him, um, and his, his, what was his friend? His friend was, um, Sir Illifer and, um, Creighton, no, I'm sorry. It was, uh, who was the other guy with him? Oh, I'm totally forget, totally, totally forgetting the other guy. I'm sure if I go down, go down to the bottom, people are going to be like screaming who the other guy was. Who was the guy that was hanging out with Illifer? <laughs> oh man. Oh well. Um, oh, it is Creighton Longbow, Creighton Longbow. Maybe they could, they could be, they could be working if you need, if you need to throw in the characters. Um, let's see here. Dee -dee -dee -dee. Feel like the faceless man could already have glass candles. It's maybe, maybe. Um, why did a song of ice and fire covers become so generic? Huh. So I, I've done a little bit of research on the covers. I was going to do a, I think it, Carmine had once suggested that I did a do a um a video on the cover art over time. And the um the original cover which is <clears throat> which is this one is done by a specific American artist who does mostly I mean, he does, uh, he does really kind of interesting covers that, that, um, I'm trying to, but this work is like almost the most boring kind of cover he's, he's ever done. Um, it was done by, uh. Let's see the cover cover artist Tom Hallman and Tom Hallman. Let's see here. The kind of covers he does. Here we go. I can go to Hallman studio, his, his website. Like he almost does like photograph like art. And so like Game of Thrones was actually kind of like unusual for him. And you can kind of like, you know, he, he like comes up with the, he He's more of a graphic designer where he like. And so you can see like a lot of his pictures or, you know, a lot of his art is like. Of pictures. Now you can see he likes faceless girls like looking off into the distance and stuff like this. But, um, you know, he designs very different kind of weird art, you know, covers. And so Game of Thrones was, was kind of, um, there it is, one of his more boring pieces. Um, and then the British artist is a more interesting guy. He... Um, The British guy he was more of a sci -fi, classic sci-fi artist who would make these fantasy covers and so the British release has much better artwork. It's real interesting stuff. And you can look at any, you know, this like weird um, 
almost Conan the Barbarian apocalyptic fantasy, like weird looking setting. And his his cover for Clash and, and, and Storm are also like crazy good. The British guy was 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 fantastic. But you're right that all of a sudden after that, they start getting real basic. Um, a sword, a crown. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's a good reason why, why they moved away from things being a little more interesting especially that Brit. i think that Brit. maybe that did that british guy die he had, he had some great that british guy his uh his cover looks a lot like the wheel of time cover have you ever seen the original wheel of time yeah cover? yeah i know what you're talking talking about mm-hmm. also might, um yeah. i find it funny that the super chatter thingle here thinks that is generic because be prepared for the new ai cover books because why the fuck should i pay these people a hundred thousand dollars I'm, I'm exaggerating but why should i pay these people thousands of dollars to use their art when i can just generate one right honestly, and to be on it to be honest like the guy who did the game of thrones original when i look at his art um his style is actually very similar to like what ai would do don't you think uh like, like, say this one. You know, it's, the woman. It's hard for me to say that because I grew up uh, going to, to school in America, where a lot of like our our English books kind yeah. of look like those covers of the girl and in the in the distance, mm-hmm. and so kind of. But I find it funny, like that this person is saying that because the three body problem cover. If you look up the Wikipedia page for the three body problem, that looks like AI, even though it's not. Yeah. Look, no, no, the, no, no, not the TV show, the the novel. Oh. What the fuck is that? Yeah, yeah. But what's gonna happen? I mean, I do, I do. So one thing I will say about like the the Tom Tom Haleman is that like he has a diverse palette. Like a lot of the stuff looks the same, but a lot of but there is stuff that's very different. You know. So when they said like, oh, come up with a come up with a uh, a cover, like yeah, he has some go tos. But like this one was, you know, Sally Field is completely different, you know, or the Game of Thrones one is completely different. This one here with this woman, this this silhouette face, it's completely different. So, you know, they they can move away from, they can just kind of do what the t- the AI isn't doing, you know. To uh, do modern different. synthesis here says basic covers equal mass appeal. True, less nerdy mm-hmm. and post HBO. Uh, post HBO Game of Thrones covers really just put like Ned Stark and Tyrion on it and just yeah, went yeah. with it. So uh. yeah, um, yeah, but it is true that there's nothing lo- really like pulling you in when it's just a a sword on the front. By the way, real quick, you know who has the fucking best? It, it's actually overtaken the fan the original fan made one which i i feel bad for but um popular ice and fire artist ertach altanos finally mastered how to say his name look up on uh google right now google images and look up winds of winter he, if, if if the first thing you see winds of winter if the first thing you see on google images is yep if it's the uh, if it's not the horn if if it's the dragon glass dagger that's yeah. that's fan art yeah, it's pretty amazing that um, uh, yeah, I'll show this. Hold on. It's funny because yeah, if if you had Winds of Winter before, it would have been the horn. But now the fact that his like fan art has like come up. So look like, up, look up Dream of Spring. You'll probably get his shit too. It's funny because even, dream- even this person's Instagram, they've popped it in there. Um, <laughs> He did a dream for. He, I think he should do all of them. Honestly, God, these are those are so good. They're so fucking good. There it is, right there. That's his, his dream. Key, his key, or is it the, the box thing? I think it's the key. Yeah. Okay. No, he sh- he should definitely do them all. Honestly, if he hasn't already, I would actually buy. I would rebuy the books with the the new update. His his like updated cover. I doubt. I doubt that'll ever happen. But yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I, I, you know, I, I, I think I just, I, I think I prefer the, um, prefer the, the, the original British covers. I think they were, uh, they were the best ones. Um, 
Ever see Straw Dogs with Dustin Hoffman? It's a movie about deception, rape, and what it means to be a man. Also, the director was a talented lunatic. I have not. Straw Dogs? Um, oh, Straw Dogs. This came out in 1971. Um... Huh. After securing a research grant to study stellar structures, American applied mathematician David Sumner moves with his attractive young wife Amy to, to a house near her home village of Wakeley on the Cornish moorland. Amy's ex-boyfriend, Charlie Verner, along with his friends Norman Scott, immediately resent the fact that an apparent meek outsider has married one of their own. Huh. I mean, maybe. I don't know. It's 1971. Seems kind of weird today. Um, but yeah. No, I, I've, I've not seen this. I've not seen this movie. Um, let's see here. Oh, isn't Die and Souls Go Into the Tree uh, the Norse mythology Idrisil thing? Is, is Idrisil... Because I thought, like, their souls went to Valhalla, or at least the warrior's souls went to Valhalla. Um, I mean, yeah, Idrisil's a tree, but, you know, you can't just... I'm not saying that, like, trees are, are um, owned by anybody, but, like... The idea of is that like uh, trees as a de a depositary depository of human souls as the afterlife is what we're talking about. So I mean I think the tree Idrisil, um, just, Idrisil just seems to be like the the tree that holds together the universe. I don't think Idrisil is any sort of afterlife location um, or like where we go when we die. You don't, you don't think of yourselves as like, oh, I'm going to enter Idrisil. Um, Um, some interpretations have the, the creation of mankind from the tree trunk and the conception of mankind originates from ancient. That eh, still doesn't, still doesn't, still doesn't have this idea that it's a depository of human souls or that it's a, an afterlife location. So no, I'd say that no, uh, you know, <coughs> I mean, other than the fact that they're trees, I don't see any connection between Idrisil and the Weirwood or Idrisil and, and like the Elden Ring tree. It's just, uh, it's just, they're trees. Um, Preston, I remember one of your theories being that the entire A Song of Ice and Fire story has two major players playing against each other, like a chess match. What do you think, who, uh, who do you think the two major players are? Yeah, no, I definitely had that idea. Um, uh, in the past, I did, you know, and I and I, 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 this was more when I when I was under the impression that George R. R. Martin was this like flawless guy who had thought about thought out his story from the beginning, and you know, as time goes on and I, I, I I've studied more of it, I kind of realized that you know he is making it up as he goes along. And so I had I had made a lot of the there's a statement in a Game of Thrones that I'd made a lot of uh, a lot of fuss about in which um where Vari says uh, 
If he does not bestir, bestir himself to, uh, soon, it may be too late. This is no longer a game for two players, if it ever was. If ever it was. And then he starts naming the other players. You know, Stannis Baratheon and Lysa Aaron have fled beyond my reach. And the Whisperers say that they are gathering swords. The Knight of Flowers writes Hydegarden, uh, urging his father to send his sister to court. Dropped plot. <laughs> you know. um, the girl is made of 14 and sweet and beautiful and tractable. And Lord Renly and Sir Loras intend Robert should bed her, wed her, and make her the new queen. Littlefinger, God knows who what game Littlefinger is playing. Yet Lord Stark is the one who troubles my sleep. He has the bastard. He has the book. And soon he'll learn the truth. And his wife has abducted Tyrion Lannister. Now, I kind of looked at this list and I was like, okay. This is no longer a game for two players. Who are the two players? If 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 the Varys Illyrio is one, is one team, who is the other team? And then he, he goes through and these are not the other team players. Like, you know... Like, like the like, and so I, I, I kind of said, well, the only other person that's left who's a player that he doesn't talk about is Doran Martell. So I was like, oh, he must be talking about Doran Martell. But now I kind of look back and I'm like, George R. Martin didn't know what the fuck he was doing when he was when he was writing a Game of Thrones. Like he might have an idea now with a Feast for Crows and a Dance with Dragons, like that time period where he's like putting things together. But, um. You know, I really did have this idea that there was like, oh, maybe this Doran Martell, Varys, Illyrio, like, fight. Or maybe Bloodraven, you know, against Varys and Illyrio. You know, that that there had to be some sort of like, who is the who is the other player? Who are they playing against? Who is Varys and Illyrio playing against? You know, I kept I, I kept analyzing this 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 paragraph. I was very caught up on it. Because it was one of like the few places where you get absolute honesty from Varys and Illyrio. And it's just kind of sad to be like, well, does George even know, does George even know what he's doing here? Um, so you know, I re you know, I really wish, I really wish, I still believe that, like, you know, at that point, you know, that they, they knew about the children of the forest or they knew about Bloodraven or they were thinking about Doran Martell. In the end, it was just George was just writing some stuff. Because even in this paragraph, like, clearly the whole, like, Marjorie being brought to court by Loras and Renly thing was just a, a dropped plot. He came up with this idea and it goes nowhere. It doesn't really make very much sense. Like was really, was Renly really thinking that Robert was going to set Cersei aside? Did Renly know about the incest? Cause he acts like he doesn't know about the incest incest and a clash of Kings. So I, you know, I don't, so what, what, what the hell is Renly and Loras doing? I don't know. So, uh, it would be a neat little game. It would be a neat little structure if there were like two big players like this. But in the end, it just seems like there's one player, time traveling brand, and then a whole bunch of chaotic players playing games against each other. Mm. I know. Uh... Um, I bought you a huge map that had countries on it, like scratches. Like seven years ago, it's like 1.2 meters by 1.8 standard uh, Mercator projection. Got a PO box. The thing is, Ross, I have the same one. I I know exactly what you're talking about. Like the scratch offs. I don't have a, a, a post office box, but I have the same one. My wife got it for me, and the um the the, the scratchy just didn't work very well. It didn't like scratch off like a like a good like lottery ticket, but thank you. Thank you so much. But, um, um, I actually have the same one. <laughs> so years later, she got me the, um, maybe her dad, her dad got me this huge, like world map with like little magnets on it and stuff. So we have that. 
Um, that shit will arrive you next year. This dude's in Australia, I think. <laughs> the um. Actually, no, it may not even arrive to you because uh, I know a lot of people that uh, always get stuff shipped for them, to them from Europe and those boxes always come open and stuff because, you know, people like to go through that shit. Yeah. Um, when, how did you first start loving Sweet Robin and why do you like him so much? Is it his role in the story, him personally, or is it ironic? Um, maybe it's a bit of all of that. I think, I think honestly... I mean, I think the show probably, um, what's his name? Dino. Um, Lino, Lino, what, what's his, I'm trying to, he's got a, he's Italian. So he has a, um, a name that doesn't, uh, Lino, uh, Faccioli. I mean, maybe maybe it was something about Lino Faccioli's like portrayal or something. He's such, he's such a like an outrageous character um, in, in the original Game of Thrones. Like when he when he comes in and he's you know falling over and and um, being loud and everything, and it's just uh, it's so ridiculous. Um, maybe it was a bit of that, but then you kind of read it, and then you kind of get take it on a second level, and you kind of feel sorry for him. And reading a feast for crows, and there's just this you you feel sorry for him in the same sense that that sweet that uh, that um, Sansa does. Um, and then and then I, I I suppose I think I I think I read I think it was Bran Vross and the Winterfell uh, Hugh Cloy that where he like he mentions that there's something suspicious going on with the sweet sleep and stuff like that. Where I was like, Oh, maybe he has special powers and stuff like that. So it became, um, you know, it just, it became a more interesting thing that, Oh, this, this, this throwaway ridiculous character is that it might actually be, be very interesting. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I just kind of, I kind of chose him as a, uh, as a, um, a name so i call it you know i i i think on the i, I was calling myself um skin changing sweet robin on on the west roast boards and i don't know and i think i think the the name of it like skin changing sweet robin so i i guess it was like it was triggering people so much that i thought it was kind of funny you know like oh geez I didn't realize so many people had such strong opinions about this poor little boy um, <laughs> that, that claiming he's a skin changer will just like ruffle so many feathers. So maybe that was part of it as well. Like, um, like loving Robin, Robert, uh, like loving Robert Aaron, like made people angry where it's like, it's just a little boy. <laughs> like, why not? Why not like him? I don't know. Um, But I also just kind of liked him because he was an actually funny real kid, and all the other characters are too old for their age. Uh, basic covers equal mass appeal, less nerdy post HBO. Yeah, we talked about this one. Um, but the uh, I don't know. Like I'm thinking about the Dance with Dragons cover, like. Like when you look at the Dance with Dragons cover, is this a good cover? Carmine, what do you think? It's a fine cover. It's but fine. I don't even know what's on the front. A dragon shield. It's just a shield. It's just a dragon shield. That's it? Yeah, that's like fine. It Whatever. You know, it's like, is it like at first I was like, is it an amulet? Like, what is it? Oh, is it just a shield with a dragon on it? Oh, okay. And that's it. Uh, you know? And it's kind of, um, the you know, as I say, I don't think, I don't, like, I don't think A Dance with Dragons is a very good title for a book. Um, certainly not this one, considering there's not much dancing with dragons in it. Uh, I think A Feast for Crows is a brilliant name for a book. And I think 
A Storm of Swords and A Clash of Kings are both crappy names for books, but A Game of Thrones is, I think, a really good one. But, but yeah, they just, I guess, maybe Mass Appeal, I guess. <laughs> I, I like traditional Bible covers, just all black. <laughs> um. <laughs> Preston, when are humans going to tell the Shkeen that planets don't last forever and their eternal paradise will be burned up by their star? I mean, that's true. I mean, they're going to have a good, uh, you know, they're going to have a few billion years. I mean, maybe, I, I, do they, I'm not sure if in that story they explain the type of star. Like if it's, our, if it's like our type of star, They've they've got four billion years, but if it's like a a red dwarf, they might have a good like a hundred billion years. So, you know, it's a long time. It's a long time to have a good you know, good enjoyable bliss for for uh, for it. But um, but you are you are correct that there's an eventual death. Um, I think I was listen I was watching uh, Alex O'Connor, the you know the cosmic skeptic. And he was saying that, you know how we all feel like our life is accelerating as we get older? That, you know, even if you were given another thousand years, would that next 900 years just feel like 20, you know? And if you were given like a million years, would that only feel like a couple hundred, you know? Um, that maybe when these when these skiing are in there, eternal paradise and they have 4 billion years it actually only feels like 500 and they and they make it you know and, and they, they they die anyway when the when the when the uh when the planet supernovas or or more likely like more likely eventually they're going to get conquered like some 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 species, like, you know, whether it be humans or harangans or... That's the thing. Is the humans are in story, like, taking over the planet. And the Shkeen are just, like, going off to their caves. Like, how soon until some human just, like, does something to poison the ecosystem and kill kill off the Grishka? You know? And if not the humans, then the next empire after it, you know? The, the harangan minds come, you know, coming back, you know, whatever. Um, should polygamy be legalized? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I don't see any need for polygamy. Um, I understand that people, you know, have their polyamorous relationships and whatever. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me because if we're talking about, um, You know, if we're talking about a society where we want sort of like equity, the whole thing about polygamy is that if one man has two wives, that takes a wife away from someone else. You know, or if one woman has two husbands, that's taking a, a, a husband away from somebody else. Right. Because you've got and this is all assuming, you know, equal number of gay women to gay men and things like this, you know, so that like. Um, you know, if, if you have too many, like, like, uh, like Muslim polygamy dropped the number to four wives because there, there was some individuals taking a hundred wives and things like this. And like, it was, it was, it was actually like a rebellion of having too much polygamy. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I there, there, there seems to be an inequity to polygamy, you know, there, what, where one person is taking too many, um, spouses for themselves leaving not enough spouses for everyone else um so i don't know <clears throat> i don't think there's any need to, for it but if you really want to live in a polyamorous relationship you can it's, it's nothing nothing stopping you you just can't get married regarding trees afterlife have you seen aronofsky's fountain Oh, I have not seen the fountain. Now I know what you're talking. I know what you're talking about. The movie, yeah, with um, Hugh Jackman. 
Um, does this tree... What happens to this tree? Um, their souls meet after death when the star goes supernova. Conquistador Thomas Creo in New Spain fights a band of Mayans to gain entry into a pyramid. It's attacked by Mayan priests, and the story intercuts to Tom, a traveler in the 26th century who's tending a tall tree in a glass dome biosphere. Traveling through space. Uh, have you seen this movie, uh, Carmine? I don't. May maybe the fountain. Yeah. I th I feel like I have. Uh, Three oh different time God. periods, right? Oh yeah, no, I think I have seen this. Yeah. Is the um? I think he's asking about it. Is if 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 human souls like end up in this tree or whatever? Um. But I I have not uh, I've not I've not seen it. Huh. But you have and and seems to have forgotten the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, this was this was years ago. Oh my god, years ago. But whatever the case, it came out in two thousand six. So <clears throat> George at least beat beat the fountain by by quite a bit. But I've not seen it. Um. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, getting to the end, getting to the end, thankfully. Funny how Littlefinger has been trying, failing to kill Tyrion for the whole series, putting the dagger on him, Sir Mandon, Penny. What else is he cooking? <clears throat> um, well, a lot of this is, a, you know, a lot of this, these are like assumptions, my assumptions, but yes, or, or, or my beliefs, but like, um, I mean, clearly... Little finger to, to pin the dagger on Tyrion, hoping that, <clears throat> uh, thinking that maybe Tyrion would die, um, or not caring one way or the other, and then pinning the getting the 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 killing of Joffrey pinned on him, which is another situation where that that in that case, <clears throat> almost certainly Littlefinger thought Tyrion would die, but Tyrion got away. And then he has. Oh yeah, and then before that, Mandon Moore. If if Mandon Moore is a little finger plant, um, but it may be that Mandon Moore just did it on his own because he thought he was protecting his king. And then the idea is that you know is Penny a little finger crony? Penny did try to kill Tyrion, but you know maybe she's still trying. Who knows? But yeah, I mean the idea is that like maybe Penny is still is still working for Littlefinger, but. Um, you know, I do realize that, like, if Littlefinger really wants to marry Sansa, he just needs to, like, invent a letter from abroad where, where somebody's like, oh, yeah, Tyrion died. <laughs> Tyrion's dead. <laughs> That's it. He just has a lie thinking that Tyrion's never going to come back. Do you think Penny is anybody interesting or do you think she's nobody? Carmine. I think she's nobody, but I do love this idea that like it's Littlefinger behind everything trying to kill Tyrion. You got to put that in the fanfic that 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 Littlefinger is trying to kill Tyrion, even in Essos. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be interesting. You know, I think I think that's where I'm going with Penny to have her be a little more interesting than than just being another, you know, damsel for 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 Tyrion to save. Um how did the Rogue Prince meme song meme start? It was pretty. It was pretty random. I mean, I I was doing the the um, the the series of the genetics of of dragons and war, and it was really dry series where I'm going through timelines, 
and you know i wanted to put in something interesting and funny to try to to try to make it more entertaining so like every time um we'd get to damon targaryen in the timeline i would i would say damon targaryen the rogue prince and then i just had to come up with like some sort of music and in the included music uh for for um final cut there is a there's some music that sounds like porno music the electric rodeo and it seemed to fit like david targaryen and so it was just one of those things where i just kept throwing it in to try to break up the monotony of like explaining timeline of explaining family trees and um and you know that that it just became the the meme like so for that's his that's his theme you know um it's it's pretty nice that it, that it's caught on. It's caught. It only took a, clo- you know, close close to a decade or whatever. <laughs> I my my dream is that somehow somehow that theme music is gonna get into, like they're gonna put it in the House of the Dragon credits or something, like they're gonna play Electric Rodeo at some point. Um. <laughs> all dwarf stars are bastards in their father's eyes that's true that's true um the uh carmine do you have any anxiety over uh, you know besides the anxiety of your of your own death do you have any a- anxiety about like the supernovaing of of our sun or the death of the universe or any of that? No. Okay. Like some people really do have a lot of anxiety over it because they're like, wait, I I can accept that I'm going to die, but, but all of the good things I do on earth live on. But then people are like, well, eventually that dies too. Um, and so some people are like, oh, then – and that, that gives them more anxiety, like, oh, so nothing I do matters because we're all just going to die. Um, but uh, I don't know. Somehow somehow I, I'm just like, eh, do we even know the heat death of the universe is going to happen? I mean, that, that's a long way off. Lots of things could happen. Lots of things could happen, you know. So I don't know. I don't know if I have too much anxiety over it i'll accept that that our that our sun will supernova that's only in four billion years but humanity can escape from 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 there that's that's no problem and andromeda galaxy i think collides with our galaxy we got to somehow figure out that one too um no longer for two players events moving too fast time to drop the danny part of the plan and go with just Aegon. Conversation in, is the in the very beginning. Is Varys begging him to hurry up? Um, it is Varys. Um, of Varys begging Illyrio to hurry up. Yes, he is. But but Varys says in that conversation that that things are falling apart here and it's largely falling apart because of Littlefinger. Um, so Littlefinger <clears throat> is, is causing chaos and war is happening faster than Varys and Illyria would like. So he's saying, um, you know, get, you know, get them, get them invading already. You know, we need them to invade. Um, but I don't know if it's the. But he's saying you're saying that it's possibly just drop the Danny part of the plan at all, like completely. Um, it's just that if if Varys, one would think if Varys really wanted Danny dead, she'd be dead. You know that that the the wine cellar incident with the clumsiness of it and jora saving her and things like that it seems like varis wanted that because he wanted to piss off Caldrogo to cause Caldrogo to want to invade you know 
rather than da actually wanting Danny dead. Um, so, I mean, it seems like Danny's still part of the plan at that point. I don't know if it's really dropping Danny from the plot at that point. I, I, I think it was it was as it turned out that he wanted he was trying to speed up Cal Drogo. Um, Uh, do, 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 do. <clears throat> just finished um, your video on the clash drafts is it possible that George moved Dario to storm slavers Bay because Dario was charming swashbuckling sailor resembling Euron a bit too much hmm hmm that's a uh... Trying to think about that, like, I mean, Euron hadn't really been fleshed out until Feast. Um, like, he knew he was a sailor. But, you know, the, the amount of mentions of Euron, even before, I'm trying to think, like, Euron... You know, like Theon, Theon in Clash, Theon looks for Euron's silence. And he said that Euron was a different song. Um, it's good that he wasn't there. And then. We start hearing about Euron. I guess they do um they do mention him a bit in clash. And then Danny has the vision of Euron of Euron that later gets changed to a vision of Victarian. Um Lord Balon's eldest brother had never given up the old ways even for a day. His silence with his black sails and dark red hull was infamous in every port from Ibn to Ashai, it was said. You know, it's funny because like Euron could could totally be Dario in these early in these early things because like <laughs> Dario Dario shows up in that port as a sailor, and he's this infamous guy that's supposed to be anywhere. Like someone could completely think that Dario is Euron at this point, because um, you you hear all these stories about Euron, but. I suppose if Danny sees that vision at the House of the Undying and then immediately sees a guy that looks just like him um, in the next chapter, it's a bit, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit weird. Do they even? They don't even call him Crow's Eye yet until. Oh no, they did. Crow's, you're on Crow's Eye. They do call him that in Theon too. So I guess he's going to have the patch and everything. Um, yeah. I mean, some people are talking about like the, um, you know, Danny has the, like the, the sexual dream with, and then decides to go into, um, kill all of the uh the slavers and things like that has sex with eerie could that all of that been romance with 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 euron i mean not with euron with um with dario before meeting dario or something yeah it's hard to say hard to say like why dario like the introduction of dario was pushed was pushed off um, not enough time or something um um, with Cal Drogo being dead or whatever, or being, you know, I I think it's probably like she's told at the house of the, at the house of the Undying that she's going to have three romances, and you really want the second romance to be introduced immediately after the visions or something, something like that. I'm not sure. Um, 
Fountain is super weird, but extremely beautiful. Most beautiful movie I've ever seen. It's all about embracing death. Also, all the effects are practical. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I do it. I do remember it being a movie that I was supposed to see and then I never got around to seeing. Um, but when I see these pictures of it, it's like. So I'll show these. Uh, you know, it's a lot of this like glowing, glowing golds and, and bright colors and. And um, stuff like that. Hmm. Well, all right. I have to. I have to watch it soon. I'm sure, it's on something. <clears throat> okay. Um. Are you gonna put your old your old Podrick works for Littlefinger idea in the fanfic, or the thing about Littlefinger being a skilled swordsman? Huh. I haven't thought about Littlefinger being a skilled swordsman. That'd be funny. Um, yeah, I don't know about the Podrick works for Littlefinger idea anymore. Maybe. Um, you know, it's just that like Podrick, Podrick, you know. It's, it's so important that Podrick exists as this like pure thing that that Brienne is fighting for that for her to find out that he's that that it's all a lie and that he's um that he's actually like scheming would be quite a turn. So I don't know. I don't know if that would fit, you know, to be like that that she was tricked the entire time. Um, and that she should have, she should have, uh, you know, like if, 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 if Brienne is going to eventually, you know, kill Lady Stoneheart and reject oaths and everything over the innocence of Podrick and, and Sir Hyle, um, you know, they, they, they better be, they better be worth it, you know? Um, so I don't know. Then again, I don't know. Was, was, was King's Landing worth it <laughs> for, for Jamie? <laughs> Maybe. <sighs> Might be fun. Might be fun. Uh, what do you think? Do you, uh, Carmine, do you think Littlefinger has any ability with the blade? Do you think he's been practicing at all? That would be or the dumbest fucking death. I mean, the dumbest death for, for Blackfish ever. The Blackfish draws his sword, and he's going to go kill Littlefinger for some reason in the fanfic, yeah. and then Littlefinger just smokes him. Like, <laughs> oh, where'd that come from? I've been practicing. After that battle, with Bla after, after getting killed by Brandon, I was just like, better practice. <laughs> <laughs> um. I've been watching The Wire recently. It's as good as you said. Does Ziggy's huge fake penis affect the plot in any way? Or is it just an HBO thing? It's just an HBO thing. There's no... Ziggy, Ziggy's penis has nothing to do with anything. It's just he whips it out. He whips out this fake penis. And that's it. Like, it has no effect on the plot whatsoever. Um, it's funny because when I asked PJ about that, because he gets asked that a lot, actually. People are like, "Oh, was that what was that actually your dick?" And he 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 has he's like been asked that a million times, and he's like, "No, it was a fucking like they gave they gave me this like absolutely enormous freaking dildo, like to, and to whip out. You think that's my you think that's my penis? Like Jesus Christ." <laughs> um. Oh. Can you explain Tiananmen Square? I've heard there's a lot of misinformation. I know you're very knowledgeable about China. Um, I don't think, I mean, uh, 
Tiananmen Square, I mean, you 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 essentially had a um a very large protest going on. And like any protest, you have a lot of different people um with different with different wants and needs showing up in Tiananmen Square. And you know, absolutely there were people that were um you know, wanting wanting democracy. Um, but but keep in mind, there's lots of other people with different with different grievances against the government, um, and so you know this went on. They were there. They were there for like uh, for like over a month. You know these protests went on and on, and um, it's a. Uh, you know, the government was thinking that they would die off and people would go home, and then they just didn't. And they kept getting bigger, and and so eventually they sent in the tanks and and, and started killing people. And you know, it's hard to get numbers on the on the deaths, but generally speaking, people say that about a thousand people died. It's hard to hard to really know. Um. Uh, and it's um, and with regards to like a lot of people argue about who knew about things in the government and big thing was did Deng Xiaoping did Deng Xiaoping know about it and um the thing is Deng Xiaoping he did kind of know about it and but he wasn't really in power and control anymore so you can kind of say you can kind of repair Deng Xiaoping's like you know uh like, you know, personality, you know, like story, because everybody loves to put Dung on, on a pedestal. You could say, well, you know, he wasn't really the person in power or control, but he did kind of know about it and he didn't do much to stop it. So it was, uh, it was bad. So anyway, after that, um, it greatly affected China, like greatly, greatly affected China. It great, like there has not been massive protests like that in China since. Uh, everybody knows what will happen. Um, there's no, there's been no serious, you know, movements for democracy. It's, uh, and it took a long time for the the China, like the the 1980s in China was seen as this golden period where China was opening up and. Uh, looking for new ideas, and then eighty nine happened, and all illusions of that like went away. Like yeah, like the Chinese economy recovered from it, and the, the investment happened again. But this idea of what died with Tiananmen was the, was the idea that China is ever going to just naturally transition to to um, liberal democracy like on its own. It's just not going to happen. And for the and time is proven that it's nothing's nothing's happened if anything we've gone further away from it with with uh xi jinping's like moves um xi jinping by the way is just like for those that don't know the current president of china um there there's supposed to be a two-term limit on them and he forced himself into a third term and probably will have more after that and so there's just things have really changed for for how people see china like you know you kind of went from the 80s where people are like oh china might actually transition to become a like a liberal western democracy you know to no that's not going to happen but maybe it's going to take on the singapore model of like you know uh the singapore model of like strict but benevolent dictatorship and then it's very clear that it's not doing that either it's it's just going you know oligarchy kind of way so you know I, you know that's i don't know if there's like too much misinformation about tiananmen in the west like <laughs> we know what we we know what happened with tiananmen but um you'll hear i don't know chinese people don't like talking about it it is it is it is an issue you do you know they don't want to bring up because it's, it's a lot of trouble. Um, but, but yeah, you know, the, uh, 
by the way <laughs> so oh so i um i was t- i i did a podcast with um with amber from road road to torvalon uh on on three body problem and we we didn't even talk about china that much we only talked about china a little bit but man there was somebody in the in the comments that was like you know this foreigner thinking he knows all this crap about China, blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, oh my God. Like, and then, um, I don't know, there's some arguments back and forth between people on it, but it was such a weird thing to have like one of these like weird pro China people like show up in a, in a, uh, in a, um, in a comment section where I wasn't even saying anything like very, very like big or crazy about China. Like what I've said right now is much more controversial than like what, what went on in that conversation about the three body problem. I think I said, I think I said in that, that like when one criticizes the cultural revolution, one has to be very careful. And it's very interesting that the author of three body problem, um, Sushin Liu like walks that line. Um, because he does criticize the the uh, the cultural revolution in that, but you have to be very careful on how you criticize the cultural revolution and who you criticize about the cultural revolution. But somehow that don't worry, comment, I uh, yeah. Am- Am- Amber showed me the comment. Don't worry, I went in there shortly after and defended you. I told the guy that Preston knows a lot about China. He's watched anime, so. <laughs> I did not do that. I promise. I, didn't. <laughs> I know. I know. But it's just kind of, it's always, always kind of funny, you know, cause, cause you know, in the West, you don't run into pro China people. Like there's just, you know, you might run into one weirdo who's kind of an apologist, but like, it's really weird when you run into like, pr- like pro China people like, no, the, the Chinese government's doing great things. You're like, okay, dude. <laughs> Oh, it's like the weirdness of running into like pro-Russia people too, you know, like, um, and coming to the end, which is probably good. Um, oh, great. Which great houses do you think will be wiped out completely or not be able to further their line? Um, Huh. I'm trying to think like of the great houses because we got, I mean, it, it, uh, the Tullys just have, just have, um, I mean, the Starks, you know, there are the main characters, so they're not going anywhere. The Lannisters, there's so many of them. The Tyrells, there's so many of them. The, um, I guess the Baratheons, the Baratheons are probably the close to getting wiped out, right? Um, Carmine, I'm trying to think like, because you just have to kill Stannis and Shireen and the Baratheons are all gone, unless you count Tommen and, and, and Marcella. No um, count. Uh, hmm. I think so. Yeah. So, I mean, Sweet Robin... But Sweet Robin looks like he's going to die, but probably won't die, right? What about the Tullys? The Tullys, you got Edmure still alive and Blackfish is still alive, right? And Edmure's... Um, Edmure's baby. Edmure's, yeah. So, okay, there's three. With the, with the, with the Baratheons, it's... Not, not to um, mention you could count the Stark children as Tullys. And Sweet Robin okay. as a Tully. If you want. But with the, with the Baratheon, are we counting Maya Stone? Are we counting Gendry? Are we counting right? Are you counting Storm? bastards? You know who are just going right. to take up the mantle. Um. So really, none of them. I mean, really, none of them. No, none of them can get wiped out. It's too hard. It's too difficult to wipe people out. The Martells? No, I don't know. If, if we're going to go with Quentin is dead, then who's left? It's oh no, the Sand Snakes. If we're counting bastards, well, Tristane. And Ariane. Ariane. And then Duran. Okay. Yeah. But if we're counting bastards, then. And I think they have cousins. I think there's some Mart- Martell cousins. Hmm. So. Yeah. Um, 
Many anti-woke gamers are not right wing. Uh, they just made that Western game developers sexualize women as much oh uh, as as six years ago. That was me once. I did not care about politics, but I called myself anti-woke. <clears throat> yeah, but you know, I, I I understand what you're saying here, Joel. Um, and the thing, it, it, a lot of this has to do with like, as I say, being being a like a single issue voter on something, or or not understanding the world is like larger than, um, uh, like the world the the world one one exists in, you know, like. Um, if you think about like, like we'll bring up Critical Drinker again, or, or or like Nerdrotic, right? These guys seem to think like the only world that they kind of run into is like watching Marvel movies or whatever, watching movies. And in these movies, they don't like Mary Sue's and they don't like girl power, like getting ham fisted into movies. And nobody likes weird things getting ham fisted into movies, you know, without, without proper explanation of the plot. Nobody likes that. But then that to them, that's what feminism is, you know, and like not understanding that like feminism is this huge, like other thing that has to do with like real women in real life dealing with, you know, reproductive rights and like, you know, pay equity and, 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 and laws that, that actually affect them, you know, like, you know, feminists aren't sitting around being like, God, oh, God, oh, oh, we've got to get, we got to get another female superhero in there, you know, like no one's doing that. But in, in these kind of like worlds where like the, their whole world are these movies and these movies are very important. We we're, we're nerds are, are, are like, our, our pop culture is very important to us, but like, that's like, it's not understanding that there's a world outside of this. And so I can understand that like a gamer who is like, who say liked the fact that a few years ago there was, you know, sexy, sexy uh, characters running around in their video games. And that, that was pretty cool. And now there's, now there's not as many or there's one perceives it's not as many um, and thinks that this is like, how the political world has affected them. But that's not like, it's a very small world. You have to understand that like the world outside of like video games is huge. <laughs> like, 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 you know, so, you know, the, you know, these terms like woke and, and, and applying feminism and call and, and, and associating all of these issues, like being like, well, I'm going to support Trump because I like, sexy women in my video games it's such a it's it's such an odd connection because you're talking about like real women losing reproductive rights you know which is it's like not an odd connection it, it, it makes a lot of sense once you yeah. start to realize that of course once you start to realize that all these guys are really doing is playing to an audience that feels uh betrayed or, or something by left-wing ideology that they feel is poisoning and left wing ideology is the reasons why they can't get a girlfriend. Yada, yada, yada. I don't think no. I, I, I'm going to be very real with you. I don't think nerdrotic or even critical drinker give a flying fuck about any. No, of this. they're trying to make money. They're, yeah. They're, yeah. They're trying to make money. So Joel, Joel, what are you doing? <laughs> We've had this discussion private. Joel, he's a nice kid. Actually. He's a nice kid. <laughs> yeah. But you know, but I, you know, I understand all these things. Like when people, like when people are very focused on one issue, um, and they think the rest of the world is, is is about that issue, and and I and I see it I see it all the time. With I mean I, I you know I'm outside of gaming you pick anything and people are just like well they're very focused on their one thing. Um, like I w went on the vacation um, just before the pandemic, we uh, <clears throat> we w we took uh, our baby to the Bahamas, um, and we're in the Bahamas and it was really weird that like all of the the expats in the bahamas um were all super pro trump and i didn't really like understand it i was trying to ask them about it and it had to do with like how obama and hillary were trying to end like tax loopholes for people going to the bahamas and they were just like so against like Hillary and Obama over these like 
very specific legal things about like tax loopholes in the Bahamas. And so they were so pro Trump. And it's like, it's like you're, they're just, you're so focused on your life, you know, at that point. Um, like not understanding, like you're the Bahamas, like you're this tiny little group of islands that the rest of the world doesn't freaking care about. I mean, it's, it's, but you know, these weird expats that live there. How great um, must your life be that you you can you could literally hate someone based off one single tiny thing that yeah. affects less than zero point one percent of the population? Like that, how what? great must your life be? Yeah, That's so good, yeah. so awesome. Yeah. And to be fair, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I think you agree with me. Like, like Preston and I, we both enjoy everybody in, enjoys looking at beautiful people, men or women, like sure. in entertainment, of course. So, like you know, but it gets ridiculous, like. Um, women have peach fuzz on their chin mm. and video games have gotten to the point where like they can accurately like render a real woman's face. Yeah. And like, when you see, like if you've ever been next to a real woman, they have a little bit of peach. It, it's, it's light sure. hairs. It's, it's right there. And now you have like these disgusting neck beards, like the quartering saying they have beards like, bro, come on, dude. <laughs> yeah. So, Apparently. so here's, here's, here's the thing. Like here's the truth. Okay, men have beards, women have mustaches. Okay, this is the truth of the world. Naturally speaking, men have beards, women have mustaches. Women wax their lips. <laughs> like they they pluck and they wax and they do that. But most women have mustaches. Okay. <laughs> if you if you if you you know, just like they grow uh armpit hair and leg hair. And all sorts of things like these people get in these expectations for so long, like women have been waxing their lips and plucking their lip hairs for so long that you that they somehow have this idea that, no, they they just they just magically don't have hair there. And, you know, and women, they don't actually shit either. They just they admit rainbows, you know, they don't fart or shit or any of the other things like like. <laughs> Wow, so they're angry about showing peach fuzz on a woman's face. Yeah. I mean, it, it it like I said, it comes back to a bunch of guys who feel as though the only reason they're not getting laid and not getting girlfriends is because the liberal agenda slash woke shit mm. is uh, preventing them from doing so. If this was back in the 1950s, they would easily uh, be able to get a girl. But now they can't because, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, How do you deal with a friend with bigoted opinions? Uh, I mean, I I would say it's it's hard to know to say besides like knowing what the opinion is, and and how you can um, deal with it. I find that like, ge I mean, generally, ex depending on the the bigoted opinion, like exposure to other people that you know kind of represent the opposite of that, who are good people, like would change somebody's mind. Like if somebody hated Muslims, and I'd be like. You know, and then you take you actually take them to a mosque and you have them inter you introduce them to like, you know, people that are at a mosque, they would probably hate Muslims left less. You know, you introduce them, you have lunch with these people, you know, it, you know. But you're probably only moving the needle a little bit. Like I get that it's like it's hard to take somebody from a hard position to another to an opposite position. You can move them just little bits at a time. So you know if. If they hate Muslims, they have to they have to meet a Muslim sometime. If they hate black people, they have to meet a black person sometime. You know, um, if they hate women, they have to meet women sometime. You know, <laughs> like generally speaking, like I would say that like generally speaking, like cities have more liberal people than 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 rural areas because you're forced to actually confront and and see uh, different types of people, and therefore you kind of become more more accepting and understanding. Um, of different ways because you're in an urban center where you're, where you're confronted with it. Well, when you're in the countryside and you, you don't have to deal with it, you, you, you never, you never, uh, never see it, you know, I can actually also answer this if you don't mind. Sure. I have a friend of mine. I've known him for 10 plus years. Good dude. Ironically, his name is Brandon and he's a, he's a Trumpy. Um, is he bigoted? Ah, he dances around that line. The way I deal with it is, is my friendship with this guy worth it more than his bullshit, awful opinions? Um, 
Sometimes it is, yeah. Uh, but it also depends on what level of bigotry is he? Is he going out of his way and just lynching black people? Like, is he, or is he just saying like stupid, dumbass things he would, he says next to you because it's a private and he trusts you not to like, you know, go crazy about it. It, it, it's really up to you to decide like how crazy is he how insane is he right, on right. Some level, everyone is kind of racist on some level whether sure. you know it or not some level so sure everybody's racist and you know you, you you try to you try to fight it every day you know but you know we're all we're all racist but we you know we you, you try not to be is the is the, is the uh is the is, is what you is what you have to do <clears throat> um I did not care that Japanese games like Final Fantasy had left-wing messages because if uh, Tifa and um, if Tifa and Aretha Tifa and Aerith, yeah. <laughs> for many anti-woke pop culture types, it's about it's not about politics, but the um, the appearance of women. That was me. Joel I mean, is right. No, Joel, yeah. Joel is right on this. No, he's right. Th what they did to Rogue in the new X-Men, that's atrocious. That is atrocious. Do you know what they did to Rogue? What did they do? They, they uh, in the original X-Men 90s, I'm being serious right now. I, yeah. I know I sound like I'm being sarcastic. I'm being serious. This is fucked up. And the original X-Men cartoon, Rogue had a nice ass. They removed that, Preston. They can remove that. Those assholes. I, I blame the liberals for this. Why would Joe Biden, why would Hunter Biden's laptop do this to us? Why? I, I don't understand. Uh, By the way, this is not a joke. You can Google this. this no, is no, I'm, I'm looking at it now. <sighs> I don't know why they would do that. I don't know why they would do that. You gotta... I mean, I don't know. It, it's... Uh... You gotta understand that, like, people... People are trying to market toys to... to different groups of people and they're just thinking about what's going to market the best. You know, it's not really about woke ideology. It's about marketing. And so they're like, what's going to sell the best? I'm actually really surprised. Um, do you remember the, the Kenner X, the, the Kenner star Wars figures and then the star Wars figures they got, they came out later. They were all buffed up. Uh, I, I had a lot of the Kenner ones and they were decent. The newer ones are just so much better than we had as fucking kids. Holy shit. The articulation is insane. But this is what I'm talking about. Um, here we go. This is a great picture of it. Okay. So here's Luke Skywalker. Here is the original Kenner action figure. And then they made these 1995 action figures with like these like buff dude stuff, you know. I, never and I don't know why they did that. that. Like, why? Um, like what? You know, someone thought it might market better or something, or I don't know. It was, it was very odd. But um, but somehow they thought that like putting something in this like hyper hyper masculine way which isn't even masculine men don't look like that um but i i don't know why they make these choices i don't remember people making a huge deal out of it as being like a, a conservative liberal thing now now you can't do fucking anything without it being a liberal conservative thing you know True. you you bring back you bring back the fucking mcrib and somebody's going to be going to say it's somehow woke or anti-woke I, I i just can't they just can't they have just like gotten rid of her her big butt and had it not been a fucking uh liberal conspiracy is that a possibility that it wasn't a liberal conspiracy and they just got rid of the butt because they thought it might and, s settle can, better can a can a, a a shipping container just crash into a bridge and it just be a that. Can, can a shipping container just crash? Yeah, can a ship just uh, filled with shipping containers just crash into a, crash into a bri gri bridge? I agree on the real the real feminists. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing is like women aren't sexualized enough anymore, and that's the thing is you know I think uh, here's the thing is if we if you do you think that I'm thinking about my whole life are women 
sexualized more or less than they used to be um is mm. is society like putting them in more clothes or less clothes than they used to be is there more sex or less sex than there used to be let, let me throw you a curveball I think it's about the same, but the only difference now is that women have more autonomy over it. There are more women doing OnlyFans right now, and they're mm -hmm. profiting off their own bodies instead of someone else doing that. Yeah, that's true. Um, I feel like it's 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 about the same kind of. I mean, I think men have so. I think that the the. I I will say positively that like the unrealistic expectations of male bodies has gone out of control. Like that has gotten crazy in the past 20 years where like every, it used to be, God, do you remember, um, uh, American psycho? I love that film. It's such, oh yeah. yeah. It's such a stupid film, but I love it. <laughs> it's a great film. It's a great film. But, um, I want to talk about like Christian Bale's physique in that, um, Christian Bale described himself, described, said that like working out for this movie was atrocious. And he said he was, he was, he was eating nothing and he was working out all the time and he was dehydrating himself and not drinking water so that he would have like really great definition for the scenes. And he was like passing out. And the thing is, when I look at the Christian Bale images, they look like he looks absolutely scrawny compared to what, you know, people look like today. You know, he does look dehydrated, but like, yeah, like he was clearly dehydrated. It was like not in order to show the definition, but he doesn't look like, you know, you compare that to like how Chris Hemsworth looks. You know, mm, so things nice. have gotten very, very nice. crazy with regards to wait, like, wait, show me that picture again. Um, so I just came back. I was looking at a recipe video. Very nice. Very nice. Let's see Paul Allen's physique now. Paul Allen. Who's that? Can't believe it. I... Really? Really? His, his arch nemesis in the film. He looks at Paul Allen's like, he looks at, like, oh, never mind. Never mind. Never mind. You're ruined. Uh, okay. Okay. But the thing is, is like it's it's gotten out of it's it's gotten out of control, you know, um, and that's not a po that that's not a positive thing, you know. So, um, so now I'm trying to think like, is there any like what's happened to women? Like like who like who who are the big female stars right now? Like Zendaya. Oh, I love this conversation. It's uh, I know what you're talking about. It's uh, it's it's uh, twinkish dudes. Uh, Timothy Shamalala Bing Bong, whatever his name is, and uh, uh, who's the kid that plays Spider Man? Who's uh, Tom Holland? Tom Holland. Yeah, it's like. But they're dudes. also fucking buff. No, it's they're funny not. that you're like calling them twinkish, and they're fucking ripped. Bro, bro, Timothy Chalamet in Dune. I'm surprised that there's no way they didn't film that those scenes of him in the desert without it like putting something heavy on his feet so he doesn't fly away with a strong gust of wind. There's no way that guy was super skinny. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but um, well, Timothy Chalamet is pretty scrawny. There's no denying that, but Tom Holland is fucking ripped. Timothy Chalamet is, yeah, he's he's pretty skinny. You don't see him very much. Um... But I get what you're saying, though. We have kind of for men, we have kind of this. This is Timothy Chalamet. Stars. He's a, he's a pretty scrawny string bean. Yeah, of course. We have moved on from the typical action stars being Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone to now Timothy Shamalala Bing Bong. That's really what it, I, however, have we, I mean, what we like kinda. movie, like movies aren't still around. Like, like the Jack Reacher isn't still a fucking thing. He's like the, the Jack Reacher stuff. That's, that's like, yeah, you're, you're always going to have Jack Reacher stuff. And of course the fast guys, but those guys are older, like the newer action stars. No, which is fine, but no. Yeah. <clears throat> um, 
Yeah, Joel says I grew up. I grew up past that. Thank God. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. Um, <laughs> reminds me of a dude in your comments while back lusting after male gaze movies from the 90s my wife had never seen wild things so we watched it yesterday the male gaze was over 9,000 man holy cow um the wild things movie um that's the uh the one with um that's the one with uh do you remember this one bacon Matt Dillon. I've yeah. I, I I've heard of it, but I've seen this one. I've seen it. Yeah. Kevin Bacon. Ooh. Um. Yeah. The twist at the end. Big big. A lot of twists in that movie. I've weirdly I've seen that movie. I've not seen this. Hmm. Uh, but I don't know. I it, it it's hard for me to it's hard for me to because there's so many different movies that come out in the 80s and 90s and. 2000s and 2010s that it's hard for me to know if there's like a trend uh, on 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 um i i'm still seeing pr- pl- there's plenty of there's plenty of naked ladies around you know i don't the you know, when i was young fluctuates but when i was young there was no porn you had to you had to watch like the the playboy channel through the squiggly lines and you couldn't see anything you have no idea what I'm talking about, do you, Carmine? No. So, back in the day, this old man talk. So, back in the day, you would get a cable box when you want a cable, right? And so, you'd get, <clears throat> you'd actually press a button and you go, tch, 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 and you'd get to like HBO, was like on the high ones. And then on the really high ones were like the pay, the pay channels. You know, so one was the Playboy channel and starting at about like 10 p.m. at night, the Playboy channel would come on. However, it would be the picture would like would wave like with these like squiggly lines. The sound was fine, but you couldn't see it. You know, you couldn't see anything because of the, the wavy lines. But every once in a while, the wavy lines wouldn't wave so much. And you could see like boob for like a split second. Or sometimes when you turned on the Playboy channel at, at 10, you'd get like, they'd delay the wiggly line. So you get like 30 seconds or a minute of like the Playboy channel before the squiggly lines kicked in. And it was, it was, <laughs> is it, is it Playboy classy? I mean, certainly by today's standards. Yes. <laughs> okay. But it, like that was the world that was the world back and, and now there's just like ready porn everywhere so like i don't you know i don't understand like where people are like i can't see my sexy ladies anymore i just like sexy ladies they're everywhere you know um yeah communal porno mags oh my god yeah absolutely you know um uh, to answer your question, there is a clear divided now in triple A games in Western games. Women are less sexualized than a few years ago. Japanese Korean games just as much as a few years ago. Hmm. Huh. I mean, I know what he's talking about. He's talking about. Ugh, I know what you're talking about. So yeah. the, the 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 Japanese and, and Korea, they're always going to have those supermodel looking women. Ja- they don't give a fuck. But Western game development. He's talking about um, the Fable trailer. Uh, hold on. Look up the... It's going to sound fucked up. But I want you to look up on Google Images right now. This is what he's talking about. I want you to look up Fable trailer woman ugly. As fucked up as that sounds. Weird. That's what he's talking about. That Western developers are going out of the way to make women look like that. That's what he's talking about. I know Joel. When I'm I'm not on your dick. Don't worry, buddy. Okay. Okay. Do you see? So it? this is this is this is this is a thumbnail from somebody's YouTube video. But yes, Fable. She's ugly. Right. Yeah. So that's what he's talking about. Like how Japanese and Korean game developers they don't give a fuck. They'll make the hottest chick ever. But Americans, uh, Westerners, want to just make them ugly to 
push some kind of woke agenda. <laughs> but um, but to be fair, don't Japanese games also always have good-looking men, while yes. Western games have ugly men? I mean, I I guess this. You have you been to Russia? I've never been to Russia. No. Someone who uh, a friend of mine who has been to Russia was telling me how everywhere he looked, the women were fucking disgustingly good looking, and he's a gay man, and the mm. men were just ugh, ugh, ugh. Well, like, yeah, there's definitely there's model. definitely pla there's definitely places in the world like that. Um, oh, of course, hundred percent. Like, um, 100%. so like yes, yes, like I would say that like if you go to a place like Colombia. Like a lot of the men let themselves go while the women look really great, like keep, 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 keep working out and look really great, you know, or something like that. This is the, like the stereotype, you know, um, I, I think people make this comment about, about Russia as well, though, keep in mind, this is also a culture where I think you get uh, in some Eastern European cultures, when you get married, they give you, they give you slippers as a joke because now you don't have to work out anymore. And the idea is that you can all of a sudden <laughs> let yourself go. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, but I don't know what, what, like, I don't know what the, what the, um, what's the message of that, that somehow the, the, the message is that, um, I think, I think, I, I, I think the message is that, uh, they're trying to, to destroy uh, the liberals, the left, the wokest, they're trying to destroy traditional beauty standards because, they want the downfall of civilization or something dumb like that. It's something stupid like that. I know, but, but it doesn't make any, it doesn't right, make any just, sense. But I'm talking about like, person. like Russian society versus, or like Colombian society or whatever. Russian, like say they're taking, so they're, they're taking someplace like Russian society, which is more uh, sexist. And they're saying that oh we're in a it's a great place because men can let themselves go and women can have to keep working out and remain hot. Is that is that like the idea that when the power structure switches, like women let themselves go? Yes. Now I think that's it's I think that's a really dumb thesis because if you go to say a country where the the power structure is way off the charts like say the middle east okay um you either don't see women or they're kept inside and so they can't work out at all and they end up getting out of like overweight because they can't get out and exercise um because they just don't want to be harassed outside so i mean it, it's like i don't think that a sexist society leads to women being hot. I think that's like, I think that's a, a really weird idea. I mean, back I when America you, was I more sexist, women weren't allowed to wear makeup. They had to wear, they had to wear like right. skirts that's down the to their ankles. Um, right. That's the point. That's the whole wave of like new conservative guys, younger guys. Well, I mean, there's this weird, I get it. There's, there's this, there's this weird Andrew Tate world of like, of like somehow being sexist, but, but also having all the, all the women dressed like strippers or something. Like it doesn't, how, how, what is this world? Where is this world existing? How are you getting traditional male sexist, like power structure, but then all the women looking hot? Like, how are we, how are you achieving that? It doesn't make sense to you because you're a normal human being. Um, you're yeah. not a, you're not a, you're not a piece of shit. So it doesn't make any sense to you, right. but that's, that's, that's usually the bullshit they're trying to push. Um, it's less Andrew Tate and more like the fresh and fit guys where oh. they, they feel as though I'm sure you don't even know who those are, who those guys are. Uh, I, I, feel I, as though, I do. I do. They're, they're, they're like that, that group of, uh, the group of dudes that hangs out and they, they like, it's like a, a bunch of black dudes that hang out and talk about, talk about, um, I don't know, they, hitting, they invite, hitting, hitting that shit. And... 
they they invite only fan models on to make fun of them and, and call them dumb and, and stuff like that the whatever podcast does the same thing but the reason fresh and fit have such a, a weird skewered view of of women is because they only hang around those only fan models so of course they're going to think a lot of women are like this or only out no. to, to just you know use their body to get money and so and so forth but that's not obviously that's not true um so yeah it, it's like a whole rabbit hole yeah. it really is hmm um you've reached the end by the way no you know? no I, I did but i was i was like thinking about uh, so i remember somebody telling me a joke years ago and he was he, I, I, it didn't land very well to the audience he was talking about but he, he was talking about how he had lived in kyrgyzstan for a while and there there was a lot of um sex work in kyrgyzstan and and he was just he was making a joke and justifying it and he was like oh you know Sex work is very close to like, it's just like pure male female interaction was his story, and he's like, because what do what do men care about? They care about sex, and what do women care about? They care about money, and therefore like, you know, prostitution is like getting down to the basics of like male female dynamics. And of course, the audience he was telling it to is just like, what are you fucking talking about? Like what? like women only care about money and men only care about sex. Like what? Like, like, like no, nobody there was able, was, was willing to like reduce themselves to that. I mean, I, you know, um, but I, maybe that's it is that it, it, it's just, it's so reductive. Like you, you're only going to reduce women to, to sex and then men to, to what's the like again money like like what is Andrew Tate's appeal? There's he has none other than the fact that he had money, right? Um. So I don't know. Um. The outrage is so ridiculous. There are calls for boycotts and, and just having an undealt female character. It is pretty funny what you showed me there. Um. Preach was listening to a podcast about the rise and fall of prominent adult website, and they talked about the history of adult stuff online as pay. Uh, friends eight years younger was like, it wasn't always free. <laughs> um, I guess, I, I mean, it was kind of like they tried to have like, there was always a place to find it for free. It's true, but it was it was a little harder where people would like. But the the, the it used to be that the they would offer like one dollar a month or whatever, and people would pay the one dollar and then cancel it after a month and then do another place for a dollar. I think that was more the kind of thing. And now it's all like ads, right? Banner ads and stuff, trying to make their money. Um, I don't know how porn makes money. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, the fact that natural humans are considered woke is pathetic. That is kind of funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we've been talking for eight hours about hot men and women. It's true. What happened to ice and fire? This, this is like the stream where we're just talking, where we're just talking, uh, um, uh, <laughs> anyway, let let's uh, let me do this last one and then I gotta head to bed. But thank you, everybody. Um, do you see a Song of Ice and Fire prototype characters in an Armageddon rag? Uh, Larry Richmond, Fagon, uh, Eden Morris, Illyrio, Stannis. You know, it was it's it's you know uh, the um, obviously there's the one character who who looks like Blood Raven, the 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 head of the who's the albino guy who's the head of the the band but his character doesn't seem like it and i find i think the protagonist from armageddon rag is really bland so i don't really know if he if he strikes me as anything but i don't know i don't it's a good question but i think i think i would have to read armageddon rag again and really think about it because i didn't i didn't read it too much thinking about like characterization in mind and like how their personalities and stuff like that. I was like, you know, I, every time I read it, it was more like the plot and what's, what's the, what's the lore and the magic and the, and the prophecies and how is this working? I was, I was looking at it from that lens and like the nature of ghosts and stuff like that. I, I've never really 
like read or appreciated the story on like who the characters were. Um, so maybe I, uh, I don't know. I could probably do that sometime. So, um, <laughs> when George refuses to release Winds of Winter, we have to resort to gender relations talk. Anyway, thank you, Carmine, for uh, sticking with me. Um, and uh, anything else you want to uh, quickly talk about before we go? Uh, what's on the docket for April? What are we doing? We're finishing up uh, the drafts, getting G stuff on, and talking with him for a little bit, asking him some questions. Yeah, yeah, what I else? Think so. I'm sure yeah. maybe another House of the Dragon trailer will come out of something. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm gonna try. What's to... on the docket? What else? Gonna try to get out for Tyrion three. Gonna try to um, uh, finish my book. Um, we'll see how it goes. We'll you're, see you're, how it your goes. Your non Fire book. What's that? Your non Ice and Fire book. My non Ice and Fire book. So anyway. Yeah. Tell tell give a give a give everyone a quick update on that. Like, how far along are you? Are you done? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's done. I just have to do some editing on the, on the, on the last, on the last quarter of it and then figure out how to publish it. So we'll see how it goes. Mm. I don't believe that Aegon is who he claims to be. I think he might believe he is. I'm not sure if he is or not. So we'll see, but we'll see. We'll see. All right, man. Uh, uh, thanks everyone. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.